All right, good morning, jurors. You may be seated. Cross and thing. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Ms. Zachary. Good morning. Ms. Zachary, in, uh, in, in this case, you agreed to cooperate with the state. Is that true? Yes. And you agreed to come in and testify against Ms. Gutierrez-Reed. Is that, that correct? Yes. And as part of that, you entered into a cooperation agreement with the state. Is that right? Yes. And that cooperation agreement indicates that if you agree to testify and you have to provide truthful testimony that you will not be prosecuted for any crime. Is that right? Yes. So as part of your being here, you have a complete immunity from being prosecuted, correct? I guess. Well. Can you speak up? Yes. yes. Sorry, I'm close. Uh, it's okay. Is that better? Hey, uh, it, is that your understanding of the document that you have a complete, that you're not going to be prosecuted, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, you testified yesterday that you had, uh, as far as the props roles, you were Hannah's boss in that role. Is that right? I when I say boss, I guess a supervisor. What I said goes with props. And Hannah was a props assistant, correct? Part-time. Okay. And she was also a part-time armor? Uh, full-time. Uh, your understanding, she was part-time props and full-time armor? Armor was her main duty, yes. Okay, but she was also doing props as well, correct? When there was no firing of any guns, yes. Well, didn't you ask her on several occasions, for example, to uh, do things like rolling cowboy cigarettes? Uh, that was one day. Well, you asked her to prop up other characters at, at times, right? Uh, the only props that other characters had were the guns. They didn't have uh, their belts? Uh, well, yeah, they had belts. And they didn't have, for example, uh, glasses or other items that they needed to have on them? What type of glasses are you talking about? Uh, anything you'd have in a Western movie, hats? Glasses, they didn't have other props? Those are wardrobe. Okay, what other props were there with regard to these actors besides firearms? Um, there were very miscellaneous things depending on the scene. There was a day where we were in a saloon, there were whiskey glasses, there were rolled cigarettes, um, there were a poker sets, those kind of things. And those props had to be provided to those actors, correct? Um, yes. Okay. And, and you also testified that you had some armor duties, correct? Correct. And so you were in that role assisting Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, right? Correct. And as part of that, you loaded and unloaded guns on the set? Correct. Now, you were trained, I think you said, by, by Seth Kenny on a prior film? Yes. How much training did you receive from Seth Kenny? I had maybe 10 days to prep for that set, so within that amount of time, when I would meet him, he would show me how to work with the guns and ammo. So did you feel proficient, uh, very good, in working with guns and ammo? In what I was using, yes. Were you? I think you've said in the past, and you can tell me if you disagree, that you were not able to tell a dummy round from a live round? Mm, I don't recall saying that. Now, yesterday you testified that you weren't familiar with the single action uh, revolver. Is that right? I didn't say, or are you talking about when I entered or started rest? Yes. Yes. And so, as we sit here today, do you know the difference between a single action and a double action? Uh, yes, now I do. Okay, and what is that difference? Well, the, what we are using on rest uh, on between the two, uh, it involves um, how you load them and unload them, from well, my understanding. The, the difference in functional characteristics between a single action and a double action? Um, so with the single action revolver, I believe that's what we are working on with rest. 
um, that was with uh, um, cocking the hammer back and the trigger at the same time to uh, load and unload the cylinder, whereas uh, with a double action, uh, that the cylinder flips out. The cylinder flips out. Sorry, uh, you. Um, the cylinder comes out on the side to load the revolver and closes back. Before Rust, had you worked with a single action type revolver? No. So on the prior set with Mr. Kenny, he had just shown you a double action? Yes. Okay. Um, so with uh, yourself and Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, you also had Nicole Montoya helping, is that right? Correct. And Nicole Montoya was also a props assistant, is that right? Yes. Now I think you said yesterday that uh, you, uh, you knew that there was going to be an armor and an armor's assistant. Did you say that? I knew that Hannah was going to act as both. Okay. Was it your understanding that on this film that there was supposed to be an armor and an armor's assistant at first? Yes. Okay. Now, um, with regard to your armor duties, you, we know that you loaded and unloaded weapons. Did you also um, take those at times to the actors? Yes. And I think we saw a video yesterday where, and see if you remember the scene, Mr. Baldwin is coming out of a little structure. He's shooting towards the cameras up with a blank ground. He runs up the hill with the child actor, and then he gets and somebody yells cut, and he still shoots, and then he cusses. Do you remember that scene? Um, yeah, I believe so, yes. And it appeared, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you were on that video running towards Mr. Baldwin after he shot. Does that, is that what happened? I'd have to see the video. Okay. I bet you don't recollect it right now as we sit here. Not at the moment. Okay. On how many occasions did you yourself take firearms to actors? Um, whenever Hannah needed it. Okay. When she needed assistance? Yes. Okay. You were working under Seth Kenny's license, is that correct? Yes. And that's with PDQ Props? Correct. And as part of that, are you on his paperwork as being an employee? Uh, I believe so. And so you weren't actually working at physically at his business, but you were on, on the paperwork, you were working with PDQ Props. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. Now, yesterday you indicated that first you said that you had thrown away the revolvers, but that was just a miss. Uh, you just got ahead of yourself. Is that right? Yes. Okay. In reality, uh, what you did is you threw away rounds from two revolvers, is that correct? Correct. And that was right, uh, that was after the shooting, correct? Yes. Now, after the shooting, do you recall how many minutes uh, went by, just roughly, before you threw away those rounds? I don't recall. In that time frame, you also had a conversation with Seth Kenny, correct? Yes. And on that conversation, you had texted him previously before that and said emergency? After the incident, yes. And then you, you all talked, and do you recall him giving you any instruction or advice as to what you were calling about? And don't, don't tell what he said, but do you recall him giving you any information? No. Okay. So do you recall anything from that phone call? Again, not telling us what Mr. Kenny said, but do you recall anything from that phone call? Yes. What do you recall? Just him mortified. Okay. And don't talk about his words again, but just uh, so your impression was he was mortified. Yes. Okay. Did, how long did that phone call last? Um, as I said yesterday, possibly 30 seconds, a minute. So then in that time frame, you then throw, throw rounds away from the two revolvers that you had previously loaded, right? I believe so, yes. So the two revolvers that you loaded, again, were uh, the Jensen Ackles revolver, right? Mm -hmm. And then this Sven? Uh, Swen. Swen. How do you say his name? Swen. Okay, Swen. So those two revolvers, you threw the rounds away from. Yes. And you threw them in a trash can. Correct. Now, you didn't tell anybody uh, at the scene that you had thrown those away, right? 
I didn't tell anyone, but it was in a public place. If someone saw me, then yeah. Well, um, you didn't want to let anybody know that, did you? I, they weren't the rounds in question, so I didn't think it mattered, and I had honestly forgotten. Well, you knew that, that somebody had been shot, at least one person had been shot, correct? Correct. You knew that 911 had been called, is that right? Uh, I didn't hear anybody call 911, but I had assumed. And you would have assumed that the police would have to respond to a shooting, correct? Sure. And so, as part of that, wouldn't you think that the police would want to see everything on set? Yes. So when you throw away rounds um, that they may have wanted to see, don't you understand that to be an issue? No, because again, it wasn't the rounds in question. But that isn't your determination, right, to determine what's in question. That is the law enforcement's determination, correct? Okay. Uh, well, would you agree with me on that? Sure. So, law enforcement's going to come and, and you understand they're going to investigate what happened and the rounds that you're throwing away could be possible evidence that would assist them. Would you agree with that? Sure. And so, when you made that decision, was that in fact Mr. Kenny directing you to do something? No. You threw away those rounds and the two revolvers that you loaded, was it your intention to get rid of the evidence that you had done, in other words, the two you had, you had loaded? No. Now, you also, as I understand, took uh, firearms, or you and a couple other people intended to take firearms to the prop truck, is that correct? Yes. And did you take revolvers? Did you take long guns? Do you recall? Uh, it was whatever was on the cart, but I didn't end up taking them back. You and who was it? Was it Daniel and Nicole? Correct. And so the three of you started out to take the firearms from the prop cart to the prop truck. Is that right? Yes. How many firearms were there that you were taking back? I believe from a separate interview, I had said something around nine. So all nine of those firearms, were those Seth Kenny's firearms? I believe so. All nine, you all wanted to take back to the prop truck. You were removing them from the prop car right after the shooting, correct? Yes. You said you didn't take them back, but did you start with them to start taking them back? I did. And what made you turn around then? Um, I got a text message or phone call from Brian Norvell, and he asked me to bring Hannah her personal bag. Where was her personal bag? I believe on the cart. So you then removed the personal bag from the cart and took Correct. that? I'm sorry? Correct. Okay. And then who did you take that to? To Hannah. Okay. Um, when you took it to Hannah, her personal bag from the cart, where was she located when you gave that to her? She was with Brian behind one of the houses in the town. So we have the church. Uh, we've seen the church and we've seen where that was located. Where was the house where Brian and Hannah were staying at that time? Uh, it was down the hill a little <laughs> east, northeast of the, of the church. Did you know why Brian and Hannah were standing over there after the shooting over by the house? It was my understanding that Brian was consoling Hannah. Okay. So in any event, you walked her personal bag from the cart all the way to where they were at. Yes. Okay. And that was at Brian Norvell's direction? Yes. So you would agree with me, at that point, you didn't have it. I mean, that was somebody else telling you to do something. Yes. Okay. But, and it's not your fault on that one, but uh, on, in terms of taking that bag, I'm not trying to say that. But would you agree with me that that then took something from the prop card as well? Sure. At that moment. Okay. And again, this is before law enforcement has arrived? Um, I believe so, but I don't remember. Okay. Now, yesterday you said that you had thrown away the rounds in a state of shock and panic. Do I have that right? Yes. Now, did you previously um, state that you had thrown them away because you had done that before 
that oh, okay. I have thrown away dummies before. Okay, so in your pre-trial interview, you mentioned that part of the reason you threw those away was that you had done that before after scenes, correct? Uh, sometimes, yes, if I didn't need them. So, would you agree with me, you, you've given two explanations for why you threw away the rounds, uh, in a shock and panic, and that you had previously done something like that, uh, throwing, throwing away rounds, would you agree with me? Yes. Are these dummy rounds? These are obviously reusable, aren't they? They are. So, uh, when you throw them away, somebody has paid for those, like production or, um, well, production. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yes. Did they instruct you, production instruct you, to throw those rounds away after scenes? No. So, this is their property. Would you agree with me? The dummy rounds? I mean, you throw away blanks afterwards, too. Well, uh, if blanks can be reused again, wouldn't you agree with me that those are something that the set could use again, that they purchased? Blanks can't be reused. Okay, well then, how about dummies? Sure. Okay. So, again, my question was, would you agree that, that that's their property that you're throwing away? Um, I guess so. Okay. Um, so, you made the decision to throw away the rounds and you then interviewed with the police on October 21st. Do you remember that? Yes. And that was the same day? Yes. And do you recall whether you told them that you had thrown away those rounds? I don't recall if I did or not. Okay. Did you tell anybody else that you had thrown away those rounds? Uh, I believe Nicole was standing there when it happened, so I'm sure she saw. After the, the shooting had happened, uh, did Ms. Gutierrez read, did you see the rounds that came out of the revolver? She showed me, yes. And did you see what happened to those rounds after she showed you? No. Did you take possession of the spent casing from Ms. Gutierrez Reed? I believe I might have. I know I had said that before. Yes. And so, Ms. Gutierrez Reed hands you the spent casing, which is the one that's been fired, correct? Yes. And then what did you do with that spent casing? I believe I took it over to the prop cart. What happened to the other rounds that Ms. Gutierrez Reed had shown you from that revolver? I don't know. Did you follow up to see what had happened with them? No. Okay. With regard to um, that live round after you put it on the cart, did you touch that again? Touch the spent casing? Yes. Um, no. Okay. So you came back over, then did you go and check other rounds to determine whether you believed them to be live? Yes, as I said yesterday, I did check the box that was on top of the cart. Okay. Now there were multiple boxes on the cart, correct? Uh, I believe so, yes. And so, did you rattle some of those rounds? Uh, in the one box, yes, that was on top. And you determined that you believed there were... I think there was a statement that... And you can tell me if I'm wrong, but that you thought maybe half of them might be alive? That was an original statement, yes. And in hindsight, do you think that's not correct? As I said yesterday, I don't think that's correct. Okay. But in any event, you determined that some of them were, were alive in your belief? Yes. And who did you tell that to? Law enforcement. Okay. On the day of the shooting on October 21st, do you recall there being any safety meeting? Uh, no. That same day, there's no safety meeting. Do you remember right before the incident in the church, did Hannah take the revolver to go check it with Dave Halls? Yes. Okay. You were not in the church, correct? I was not. And you were located outside. Where, where were you? I was at the prop truck. Or not, sorry, prop cart. Prop cart. And your cart, was it to the right of the church? Uh, when you're looking at the church at the front door, then yes, to the right of it. Okay. The uh, revolvers that you remove rounds from and throw them away, you 
Do you remember how many rounds were in them? I do not. Okay, so you're not able to to tell us whether there were six or whether less, you don't know? It's been two and a half years, no. Okay. But you did testify yesterday. You knew, you said that they were dummies. Correct. How did you know that? I personally checked them. And then you don't remember how many of them there were, though? No. When you interviewed with law enforcement, did they ask you for your phone? On the day of? Yes. I don't believe so. And you had been texting and, and talking to Seth Kenny, right? Correct. Had you been texting and talking to anybody else that day? Um, just, I, I don't remember. Okay. After the shooting, well, let me uh, back up. Yesterday, I think you mentioned, and tell me if I'm wrong, that you had not, you wouldn't talk to Alec Baldwin much on that set. Is that fair? No. Okay. Did you have Mr. Baldwin's cell phone number before the shooting? No. Did you ever text him before the shooting? No. Um, do you recall that you did text him after the shooting? Uh, yes. And how did you get his, Mr. Baldwin's number? His assistant had personally contacted me because um, I was in contact with him before, while we were shooting, and he had requested to talk to me. Okay, and so after the shooting, you and Mr. Baldwin, do you talk on the phone also? Uh, yes. And you also text? Um, a couple times. Do you recall making the statement on October 31st, 2021, that Alec called me and I'm trying to make sure I keep my facts straight? Uh, yes. And do you recall you made that statement to Seth Kenny? Yes. How many calls and how many, or how many calls, let's start with that, did you have with Alec Baldwin after the shooting? Maybe three. And did you discuss the facts of what happened with him? Um, it was more theorizing because he, he, we both didn't know what happened. He mainly would call and ask questions that I didn't have answers to. He was asking questions about the events and what might have happened, right? Correct. Did you ha ask him questions? No. You also texted with him several times you, you remember that? Yes. Okay. You recall also making the statement on or about October 23rd, 2021, that you had talked to Alec and he's having a difficult time recalling things, like most of us, but he thinks that Dave handed him the gun. Um, I don't know who was, that was with. Uh, if I showed you a text message, would that refresh your memory? Yes. May I approach you? Thank you, sir. Now I'm going to show you, I'm going to ask you not to read it out loud, but just read the top text. And when you're done reading, just let us know. Are you finished? Yes. And I can have it back. Thank you. Does that refresh your memory? It does. Okay. Do you recall making the statement that you had talked to Alec and he's having a difficult time recalling things like most of us, but he thinks that Dave handed him the gun? I do. And that would, you recall making that with Seth Kenny? Yes. Okay. After the, the shooting occurred and the incident occurred, did you go back uh, on or about October 27th for the, the search of the prop truck? Um, it was, that would have to be the day that the police were there. And, and you may not recall the day, but 
Do you recall it being five or six days after the shooting? I don't recall the day. Okay. Yeah. Prior to going, did you provide the code to the safe to Seth Kenny? Um, I believe I did. Before you had provided him that code, who had the code to the safe? Hannah, me, and Nicole. You then gave the code to Seth Kenny. Did you give that code to anyone else? Um, I don't think so. The prop truck search happens. Are you present for that search? They were there before I got there. They had already started the process. When you got there, was Seth Kenny there? Yes. Did you retrieve some of your personal belongings that day? Um, not until after the police cleared out. Okay. Before that search, had you retrieved some of your personal belongings from the set? I had attempted to go back uh, because everyone else was able to go back uh, to their trucks to retrieve their things, but ours was still locked, so I was not able to retrieve anything. Ultimately, you did retrieve your property? Correct. Okay. At one point, there was a negligent discharge on set we've heard about, and, and that involved you handling a firearm, is that right? Yes. And again, you were trying to let the hammer down, and you had your finger on the trigger, and then it went off, is that correct? Yes. And that was with one of the revolvers? Uh, correct. After that, didn't you have a disagreement with Ms. Gutierrez-Reed? A small one, yes. Did you thereafter have discussions with people about wanting to fire Hannah? Uh, I didn't want to fire her. I had my disagreements with her, but I never actually fired her or okay. wanted to. Okay, you said you didn't want to fire her? No. Do you recall being interviewed on, on November 2nd, 2023, in this case? Yes. And you were asked the question, okay, did you want to fire her? Your answer is yes, and that's on page 19, two to three. You're, did you want to fire her? You said yes. Okay. Do you recall saying that? I do. Okay, so is it true then that you wanted to fire her? From props, yes. Okay, but um, a second ago you said you had not made that statement, but... Yeah, I'm correcting myself now. Okay. So the reality is that you had wanted to fire her. From props. Yes. And other people had wanted to fire her as well, right? Um, from Seth or... Just in general. I believe Seth wanted me to do something about it, yes. And and I think what you just stated is you did not do anything, ultimately. I did not, no. One of the reasons why you had wanted to fire Hannah is that you didn't feel she was doing enough with her props duties. Correct. And you communicated that to Hannah as well, right? I did not. You did not tell her that? That you wanted her to do more in her props duties? I don't think I actually told her that. I just had asked her to do things and she didn't want to do them. Did you know that Hannah and Gabrielle Pickle then had a disagreement over props duties? I did hear about it, yes. Okay. And there was an email that you knew about? Uh, Hannah showed me, yes. Okay. And I'm not going to ask you to talk about the contents of it, but you did see an email on that? Yes. That was approximately October 16th or 17th that you had had that disagreement, right? About? Uh, with Hannah, that small disagreement. Oh, yes. And so that's five days before the, the shooting. Okay. And then at what point was the decision made by you that you wanted to fire Hannah? Was it the 16th? Was it the 17th? Do you remember what day that was? I don't. You talked to Seth Kenny about that? Yes. How many times did you talk to him about that? I don't know. Okay. Now, one thing I forgot to ask you was after the 21st, uh, after the incident had happened, 
You don't have a good memory of the sequence of events? I do not. You remember that yourself and Nicole had been at the prop cart when the shot went off, is that right? Yes. And you did not see Hannah at that point, or did you? I had not. Okay. Right after it happened, is the next time that you remember seeing Hannah was when they were unloading the revolver? No, she was in front of the church, um, by herself looking at the church. Okay. And then at, at some point they unload the revolver and then she goes over with Brian Norvell to one of the other houses. Is that right? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Did you see Hannah get loaded into the police car? Uh, no. After the incident took place and you uh, come back and given Hannah her bag, did you talk to people uh, on the set? Um, yes. And where were you standing when you were talking to people? I was in the town at one point and then back at base camp. So um, did those people include Alec Baldwin and David Halls? No. Who did you talk to? Uh, Jensen and Swen and Nicole. Did you ever see or hear about a lawyer being on set? No. Okay. After that, what time did you leave the set? Did to you, go back to base camp or home? Uh, to leave to leave completely. Maybe not until nine nine thirty. Okay, so you stayed um, approximately seven or eight hours. Yeah. Did you, what were you doing during that time frame? Uh, a lot of it was waiting around. Uh, we were at base camp for a long time, waiting to be interviewed by the police. You were interviewed then on site? Yes. Okay. Since you were on site, you would have had the opportunity to tell the police at that point that you had thrown those rounds away, right? Sure. And you don't recall whether you did that? I don't know. Do you feel like that's something that you would remember if you had done it? No. Okay, I wanna... I'm sorry, just a moment, Your Honor. Do you recall ever telling law enforcement that you had thrown those rounds away? Yes. When, when was that? Um, I remember telling them, uh, like a month later, when I was talking to Detective Alex. Okay, we're talking about October 21st, 21, when this happened. Yes. And you interviewed then, and you interviewed um, with Mr. Scott Elliott on November 2nd, 2023, correct? With who? Uh, Sorry. That, that was an interview with an investigator on this case. Um, Mr. Elliott, do you recall that, that individual? I do not. Okay. And that... Uh, interview just to remind you you had an attorney present do you remember that interview I, I remember detective Alex uh, okay Elliot. do you not remember the interview in November of 2023 when spirit Gaines was present um, I do not okay if I showed you a copy of this would, would it might refresh your memory
Ma'am, I just I want to make sure that you're understanding what I'm asking. So you were interviewed with the police, as I understand it, two times. There was one on October 21st, 2021, and there was one, I think, a month later. Do you remember that? Yes. And do you remember being interviewed a third time in a pretrial interview in this case on November 2nd, 2023? Not with the police, but with other people involved in this case. I believe so. Okay. And again, I'll ask you, do you remember your the attorney, Spirit Gaines, was present? Yes. Okay. So that's the interview I'm talking about. That was approximately three months ago. Okay. You recall that? Yes. Okay. And do you recall in that interview talking about whether you had informed law enforcement? Of what? About the throwing away of the rounds? I don't recall what I said in that interview. Okay. So that was... That was three months ago, but I know you've had several interviews, but you do not remember that. Not the specific conversation. Okay. In any event, you did tell them at some point you think uh, that you threw those rounds away. Do you recall what exactly that you told them? I don't. Okay. Did you also tell them that you had transported those firearms from that car? Uh, or that you had intended to and other people helped you? I believe so. Did you tell them that you had taken Hannah's personal bag to her? I believe so. Did you take anything else from the cart that we haven't talked about that day on October 21st, 2021? No. You also talked to Weston Brownlee after the, the shooting incident? Is that right? He did send me a message, yes. So you texted with him? Briefly. And that was about some of the things going on in this case, right? Yes. Do you recall being angry at Ms. Gutierrez-Reed at one point in honor about October 29th, 2021, you said, I hope she's put in jail. This is outrageous. I don't remember the specific text message. I'd have to look at it. If I showed it to you, would it refresh your memory? Possibly. you've had a chance to read it does that remind you whether you said that yes so you agree that she said I hope she she's put in jail this is outrageous yes thank you your honor I have nothing further thank you. Oh, I'm sorry you have one moment sure Ms. Zachary, uh, you mentioned earlier that you had rattled some of the rounds to check if they were live. Yes. Uh, did you notice that when law enforcement got there, the boxes were closed? Uh, I don't remember. Do you recall closing the box up after you had rattled the rounds? I don't recall. After, when the prop truck search was done days after the shooting, do you recall the prop cart being inside the prop truck? When police uh, came to retrieve the weapons? Yeah. I don't remember it being in the, in the truck. Did you go in the prop truck during the search? After police left, yes. Did you see the prop cart inside of it? I don't remember. Did you ever get the impression after in discussions with Mr. Kinney that he didn't want you to say anything? About? About anything. Not talk about anything? With just anyone? Yes. That wasn't my impression. Okay. Do you remember a uh, point in time when you were texting with Mr. Kenny and 
you had indicated that you were talking to Alec Baldwin, and then he responds with an emoji? I don't recall. Okay. Um, you don't recall ever getting an emoji with the hand over the mouth? No. Do you know what that, that means, that emoji that I'm talking about? One where it's just kind of going like that? Uh, no, I, I mean... Doesn't that mean to keep your mouth closed? It's not what I see that as. Okay. Um, so in your testimony, you don't believe Mr. Kenny ever told you not to talk to people about what had happened. I, That's your testimony. I don't recall. Okay. No, I have nothing further. Cross exam, I mean redirect, thank you. Ms. Zachary, I've got a few follow-up questions for you. Do you recall the specific language of your cooperation agreement with the state of New Mexico in terms of the requirement that you testify truthfully? Yes. You, do you, requ do you re recall this specific language? Oh, no. Would it refresh your memory if I showed it to you? Sure. Review that paragraph and then I'll ask you some questions about it. Okay. Are you required to give truthful testimony? Yes. What happens to your agreement with me if you don't give truthful testimony? Then I'm not bound by that testimony or, or that cooperation agreement anymore. Right. If you don't give truthful testimony, I can prosecute you if I want to, right? Correct. You were asked a variety of questions about whether or not you wanted to fire Ms. Gutierrez. Do you recall those questions? Yes. In terms of your role as boss of Ms. Gutierrez, you were only her boss with regard to her work with props. Is that right? Your Honor, I'm going to object to the... Oh, I'm sorry. Were you in charge of firearms on this set? No. Were you in charge of props? Yes. Explain to the jury what your role was with regard to supervising Ms. Gutierrez in her capacity as prop assistant versus armorer. When it came to being a props assistant, that's where I um, would ask her to help me with those miscellaneous props that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, but Armour is in a different department from my understanding, and so she was in charge of that. So what she said goes for the weapons, not props. Does the Armour have autonomy when it comes to weapons? Yes. During the time that you worked with Ms. Gutierrez, did you find her to be easy to work with? No. Um, during the time that you worked with Ms. Gutierrez as her supervisor in props, did she call you a cunt? Yes. Was it around that time that you decided you might want to fire her? No, it was just overall. But what else about working with Ms. Gutierrez was difficult other than her referring to you as a cunt? Uh, mainly 
I just felt like her work work ethic wasn't the greatest. Um, she wasn't always willing to help in a year or two. She was usually wanting to be in the truck to clean guns for the day. And yeah. Uh, did Ms. Gutierrez ever show up to set late? Uh, one day, yes. Did she give you a reason for that? She had a migraine. She told you she had a migraine? Correct. But she was able to show up and work at some point that day, right? Yes. So apparently the migraine didn't last all day? No. After the incident, did you have contact with Ms. Gutierrez when she was sitting in the back of Mr. Benavides's uh, police car? Lisa, yes. And why were you having contact with her? I was just checking on her to see if she was okay. And did you ask her if she was okay? Yes. And what was her response? I don't recall. Did she express concerns to you about how this might affect her career? No. Yeah. Ms. Zachary, during that conversation, do you recall Ms. Gutierrez saying anything about her career? Yes. And what did she say to the best of your recollection? Um, I don't remember verbatim, but it was about that this was going to ruin her career. Now, at the time that she's telling you that she's worried about her career, is there a life flight helicopter on the ground waiting for Ms. Hutchins? Your Honor, objection again. Uh, overruled. Um, I think it was before that. It was before life flight arrived? It was right after the incident. But police were on set, correct? I don't. Again, Hang on a second. I'm, I'm sorry. I agree with you. Um, when you spoke to Ms. Gutierrez, where was she? She was in front of the church. When you spoke to her about her concerns about her career, where was she? She was in front of the church. I'm sorry, she wasn't in the police car? Not, no, we didn't talk about that at that point. You didn't talk about that at that point? Not that I recall. Okay. At the time that you spoke to her and she indicated concerns about her career, what was happening? Chaos, everyone was trying to figure out what happened. Were people screaming? It was after Joel screamed, and um, I know that the script supervisor was getting angry at everyone. Do, do you know, was 911 being called? I didn't, like I said before, I didn't hear 911 call, or being called, but I assumed that they were being called. If you know, were people laying on the, on the floor of the church? Joel, I saw Joel at that point. You didn't see Ms. Hutchins? Not, I didn't seem uh, Helena at all. But you understand that she was laying on the floor also. No objection. Um, at some point later, did you realize that Ms. Hutchins was injured? I was told, yes. And when you saw Ms. Gutierrez um, after the incident, was she standing at the door of the church? She was a little further back. At any point in time, did you see her standing at the door of the church? No, I don't recall. Okay. Can you explain to the jury why you thought it was important 
after the incident to remove the guns from the area and get them back to the prop truck. And like I said, uh, Jensen Knuckles had told me to get the guns to safety. So that's what we were intending on doing was to remove them from the set and get them back to the safe on the prop truck. And you were asked to provide Ms. Gutierrez her personal bag, is that right? Yes. And I, I, wanna, I want you to, to describe that for the jury. Um, what did it look like? I don't remember. Was it the fanny pack or not? No, I objection. That, that, I don't think that's leading. Was it the... Overruled. Was it the fanny pack? I don't remember. Okay. You talked to Mr. Bowles about the fact that on occasion you would throw away dummies after a scene was shot. Why would you do that? I didn't need them anymore. Is that something that you did when you were working on the set of Rust? I believe so, yes. Okay. How many times do you think you did that during filming? I don't know. Do you know whether production has purchased those dummies or whether they are renting them? At the time, I had thought they were purchased, but after reading the invoices, I found out that they were rentals. So who were they renting them from? Uh, the vendors, uh, Seth Kenny and Billy Ray. Okay. At, at some point, you were asked by law enforcement to uh, agree to a full extraction of your cell phone, correct? Yes. And did you agree to do that? I did. Um, Mr. Bowles asked you some questions about your contact with Mr. Baldwin. To the best of your recollection, what specifically was the issue that, that you and Mr. Baldwin spoke of? Mainly how a live round ended up on set. So Mr. Baldwin wanted to find out how a live round ended up on the movie set, right? Yes. Um, did you also? I did want to know, yes. And Mr. Bowles asked you about a text message uh, where you indicated you were trying to keep your facts straight. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? I was trying to recall things correctly when I was telling people things. Did you have difficulty recalling certain things? Yes. Why? I mean, in a state of shock and when everything is crazy, we, I couldn't remember things quite right. Uh, you were asked some questions about Mr. Kinney being present the day of the search of the prop truck. To be clear, where was the safe that housed the guns? On the prop truck. Was it inside the truck? Yes. And could anyone get into the safe if the truck was locked? No. You had to get into the truck to get into the safe? Yes. And you understood that the safe was locked, or that the truck was locked? Yes. At any point in time, if you recall, did you tell production, anyone in production, that you needed more assistance with props? Uh, yes. Do you know whether it was before or after that that Ms. Pickle had a conversation with Ms. Gutierrez? It was before. Do you have any experience in police investigations? No. Do you have any idea what the police are looking for no. uh, on a crime scene? No. 
were the guns or the dummy rounds that were assigned to Mr. Ackles and Mr. Timmel involved in the incident? No. I don't have anything further. Sure. I'll reserve Ms. Zachary for the record. All right, so uh, don't talk to the other witnesses in this case. You may be recalled. Okay, so next witness. Maybe we'll take a bathroom break. Is this gonna? Yes, Your Honor. Who is it? Wh whatever you choose. I think he's. I think he's ready. But if you'd like to take the break now, I don't mind. All right, let's take a bathroom break. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. We'll be back at 10. Thank you. All rise.
All right, you may be seated. Call your next witness. The state calls Joel Souza. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Have a seat, talk into the microphone. Thank you. And that water is for you. Well, thank you. Mr. Go uh, <laughs> I apologize. Mr. Souza, for the record, just state your full name. Joel Souza. And Mr. Souza, what... Oh, I apologize. Testing, testing. Okay. Okay. Sir, what do you do for a living? I am a screenwriter and a director. I want you to move that microphone a little closer. To sure. You. Sure. Thank you. Um, how long have you been a screenwriter and a director? Oh gosh. Um, I've been a working screenwriter and director for, I, I wrote before I directed, so 20 years on the writing, gosh, let me date myself here, uh, f 15 years directing. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, how did you become involved in the movie Rust? Uh, I had uh, made a movie called Crown Vic uh, that came out I think in 2018 or 2019. Um, and there was a time when the actor Alec Baldwin was going to be starring in that movie and uh, as happens with independent movies you're, you sort of get ready to go your financing falls apart you push the boulder uphill again your financing falls apart you rinse and repeat endlessly sometimes it seems like but uh, the schedule sort of ran out on us and he wasn't able to star and he stayed on as a producer um, after that movie he he liked it and I think he felt like he missed out or something. So we talked about doing another project together with him as an actor. And I had a couple of things in mind, one of which I wanted to make a Western. And uh, he thought that sounded interesting. And so he hired me to uh, write the script. Okay. So you actually wrote the script for Rust. Yeah. And then at some point, did you begin preparations to actually turn that script into a movie? Yeah, and it it was sort of the, the a similar situation with the one I talked about before. You you meet with different a lot of different people who hopefully can put financing together for you for the movie, and you get close, and then it would fall apart and get close. You have these different iterations, and you start thinking about where you're going to film. And but uh, eventually, yeah, the a group of producers came on that was able to secure financing for it, and so then the discussions began about where you would film. New Mexico has a pretty robust tax incentive and works for many reasons for a Western. And then, yeah, so from that point forward, it was sort of we would kind of in earnest begin to start preparing to go into what's called pre-production, which is just the period in the months before you actually start filming. And how did Ms. Hutchins become involved in the movie Rust? So over time, just generally as a director, if I would see the work of a cinematographer that I admired, I would just make a note of it, make a note of their name. And I had seen a trailer for a movie she did. I think it was called Arch Enemy. Um, and I just was impressed visually. It looked like something that was sort of my, it fit my style. And so I looked into some of her other work and I had added her to a list of, of other names I had put together over the years. I know, I think, I can't remember what publication, if it was an American cinematographer or something like that, but they had named her one of 10 cinematographers to watch. That's a big deal. And, uh, and so when the time came, uh, generally I would ask one of the producers to start, if you could reach out to their agents and I could start talking to people and you know, these are the people I'm most interested in and they would do that and see who's available and who's not. And then I can't remember the exact number of people I spoke to, the exact number of cinematographers. It was a decent amount, you know, more than seven or eight. And, uh, but we had a, it was all over Zoom. We were in the middle of COVID still. Uh, we had a very long Zoom conversation where it's those kind of great conversations where first you're sort of talking about what are your influences, what are your that, and by the end you're just 
enjoying a great conversation. And uh, in the end, it had, uh, it had come down to her and a few other uh, women who I was a fan of. And uh, it was, they were all excellent, but something about uh, Helena just, we were really, really, really in tune with what we both thought the movie should be. She had some really interesting references she would make. I mean, my references would always tend to be a little more mainstream and she would be talking about some avant-garde Russian filmmaker and I, that's a hole in my game and she was gonna fill it and I loved that. And so that's, that's how I, I asked the producers to, uh, told, her that, told them that's who I wanted please don't botch the deal and uh, cause she's great. And so that's how we, we came to work together. So. Um, and during the time that you knew Ms. Hutchins, did you get to know uh, anything about her, anything about her background? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she has, you know, she has this backstory that you don't forget when you hear it. Right. I mean, she was born in the Ukraine and, uh, but she tell, she'll tell you, she says, oh yeah, you know, I grew up in this uh, naval submarine base in the Arctic Circle, and you don't hear that generally every day. Mr. Souza, without saying anything that Ms. Hutchins uh, said to you, uh, can you give the jury an idea of the kind of education and training that Ms. Hutchins received after she came to the United States? Yeah, I know that um, she had spent a little time at the University of South Carolina. Uh, it's my understanding that's where her and Matt actually met. Um, and who's Matt? Her husband. Okay. She would have been her husband, Matt uh, Hutchins. Um, I know she did uh, the program at UCLA. I think it was the producer's program. I know she did the, the master's program at AFI, American Film Institute. Um, and do you recall uh, when she completed the, uh, the master's program through AFI? Oh, that I'm not sure. Gosh. No worries. Yeah, um, I'm not sure when. I know she did. Uh, she was very, very interconnected with AFI. Okay. Yeah. Did, did her background and training, did that go into uh, part of your decision to bring her onto this project? Yeah, I, you know, it's, you know, I'm always impressed when AFI is a uh, prestigious uh, name in our, in our business. I think it's, it's always impressive to me when someone goes through there. I think um, as a woman cinematographer, I think that's doubly impressive just because if you look at the numbers in this business, they're sort of atrocious in that regard. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, in that coupled with the work I'd seen from her and just, you know, she was very keen to do a Western, uh, as I think all filmmakers are, because it's just a, a really interesting thing to do visually. Okay. And, uh, but she, yeah, I think between those things, between her work and her, you know, her background, I think she was kind of a no-brainer to me. Um, at some point, did you and Ms. Hutchins come to Santa Fe to begin um, pre-production work on Rust? We did, yes. Approximately when was that? Oh, gosh. Let me think back about this. Um, we filmed in... Sorry, I don't want to conflate it with the second go-round. Um, we were filming in October that time, so I believe we would have come out, if I go back... Uh, September in 
I guess it would have been late August. Yeah, or the tail end of August or beginning of September. But yeah, we, we both came out around the same time. She came from Los Angeles. I live up in the, the San Francisco Bay Area, so I came from there. And uh, I think she might have gotten there either the day before or after me. Uh, can you explain to the jury how other members of the crew are hired? How are What goes into hiring camera people and armorers and prop assistants? Sure. I think uh, the, uh, the department heads will will sort of pick their team. Um, like for the camera team, Helena would, would put the word out. She'd go to people she'd worked with before. She would, you know, through the union maybe, or, you know, she would basically collect resumes of people, collect, you know, recommendations from people. She would make the choices of who she would hire on a camera team. Uh, in terms of, you know, the, the production designer is the head of the art department. So he would pick his prop master, his set decorator, his, his uh, and then those people would also then pick armorer and prop assistants and people like that. The department heads would generally sort of hire their own or, or at least interview and then recommend the hires to the production office. Okay. Um, and approximately, if you recall, when did you first uh, meet Ms. Gutierrez? Uh, the f in person, I, I had a phone call with her before I ever met her. Um, the one of the folks from the production office, I can't remember if it was Gabby or Roe, had told me that they had found an armorer. They told me that it was uh, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Um, I had, of course, heard of Thel Reed. Uh, I mean, in the business, who hasn't? Uh, and so they told me that they had found her. She and so it. Uh, I was keen on having what's called a show and tell, where you would basically have all the weapons that would be used for the movie more or less laid out on tables and you would um, then match the cast up with what looks best for their characters and makes the most sense story-wise and so I wanted to have that and uh, so the production had her call me and she introduced herself to me and we spoke over the phone the first time then and then a few days later I can't remember exactly how much it was a day later a few days later I met her in person at the show and tell, and then she was training people that day as well. And at some point, I presume that filming begins and, and, and a lot of work begins. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the pre-production itself is an enormous undertaking as well. But uh, yeah, the, we eventually got to our first day of filming, yes. Um, uh, I want to ask you a, a, a couple of, um, well, prior to your work on Rust, had you worked on any other movies where there were real firearms and an armorer? The movie I had done before, uh, Crown Vic, was a movie about police. Um, and although most of the movie was spent with the two characters driving in a car so they didn't have anything on them, uh, there were a few occasions we had some armorer days where yeah, there were uh, police weapons and then an armor there with that. Do you recall how many days you, you got to experience an armor oh, on set? Maybe three or something like three or four. It wasn't an enormous amount of days, but okay. we didn't have it. There was not a lot of gunfire on that movie, frankly. Okay. Um, can you give us an idea of what your focus is in a given day on the set. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's mostly about like who you work with and interact with most. You know, my most direct interactions are with my director of photography and there's a byproduct of that, the camera team. But you're also talking to wardrobe and production design a lot because you're moving from set to set. They're asking you, you know, is this right? Is this okay? Is this okay? So. In general, yeah, I would work, you know, my script supervisor is always there with me as well. But in general, you work with the creative departments. You are spending a ton of time with your cast, with your actors. You're blocking the scenes out. You're walking them through their performances. You're sort of getting on the same page together. Um, are you... 
largely focused on uh, on uh, the behavior of the armorer? No. Um, no, I mean, you see them when they are there at set, and but no, I don't generally interact with the armorer during a during the course of the day on set. Okay. Um, and let me ask you, after the show and tell and the training that you described, uh, did you reach out to Ms. Gutierrez and compliment her? Well, there was a day on, so I think if memory serves, I think the first day of gunfire on the movie was day three, because that was sort of, I had, that day was on my mind from kind of from Jump Street with this production, because it was our biggest day of the movie. It was just to give you sort of a, idea of the scale of the day it was not just I mean we had a large part of the day was there was an enormous shootout on, going on between these bad guys and good guys I think four people on one side and four people on the other side there's an enormous amount of stunt work that goes with that you know there's gunfire there's the actors but then before that there's also we were walking the characters through town so the town was filled with background which is what we call the extras who come there were horses there were wagons it was an enormous day and at the end of the day, we had made it. And it was a tough day. And when we have days like that, I generally like to go around and thank folks and congratulate people on doing a good job. Um, if I texted her that day, it would have been because I guess I just didn't find her on set at the end of it. But uh, the day came off, and I think you know everybody had a big part in that, so. Okay, uh, and after that day, you were complimentary of her. After that day? Or on that day. On that day, yeah. Um, and you were complimentary of the other folks on set that day. Yeah. No, it's, you know, I don't know if anyone's ever spent time on set, but it's, uh, it's quite a thing to see. The people, okay. it's, it's just a lot of professionals doing some pretty amazing stuff. So. Okay, great. Um, can, can you explain to the jury what Video Village is and specifically what it was on the set of Rust? So Video Village is basically a sort of large awning or tented area. There'll be a lot of chairs inside there uh, for cast to sit, producers to sit. There's generally a chair for me, which I should have used and never did. I just tend to stay on my feet all day. Um, and then there will be monitors that are uh, basically a feed to the cameras that we're using. So you can watch what's going, what the camera sees essentially from what they call Video Village. So you can watch uh, the takes as we're doing them. Sometimes as a director, you'll watch from Village. Sometimes you'll watch from set. I think every director has a different way they like to do it. For me, it's kind of a mix. And inside Video Village, can you see what the camera sees when the cameras are not rolling? Uh, yeah, as long as the monitors are up. Um, sometimes you're dealing with wireless transmitters and things, and it seems like on any set I've ever been on, people are constantly kind of running behind the monitors and fussing with cables and transmitters and things, and monitors not down, and then it's up, and then it's down. But in general, yeah, you can see whatever the camera sees. If the camera's powered on, you can see what's going on. Um, based on your experience, as the director of Rust, was Video Village a place that, that, that you would frequently encounter Ms. Gutierrez? No, I would, you don't ever see it. Armors are never in Video Village. They're, they should be next to set. Uh, it, can you recall a single time that you saw Ms. Gutierrez in Video Village? No. All right. Um, <clears throat> And can you tell the jury generally what your understanding was of where the armor is supposed to be if the actors are using their prop guns that are real, their real mm -hmm. revolvers that they're using as prop? Where's the armor supposed to be? Uh, basically off camera. I mean, there's... I mean, there's there's crew on set, so you'll sort of behind the camera, there are grips, there's the operators, there's sort of the people that are sort of where the camera can't see them, and you would generally expect the armor to be just sort of standing off screen ready to hand or retrieve when we're starting or finishing the weapon. Okay. Yeah. Um, were you ever under the impression 
uh, based on your experience, that the that it would be appropriate for the armorer to leave real weapons with actors and then leave the area? Uh, no, that wouldn't be what an armorer should do, at least in my experience. Okay. And can you give the jury an idea of... At, at the beginning of the filming of Rust, did you even understand what a dummy round was? Not really. Like I said, I didn't have a lot of exposure to that kind of stuff before. Um, I wonder, you know, I don't exactly have a clear memory of it. I, I have a feeling the first time I heard the word dummy is after everything happened, to be, to be frank. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, during the time that you were the director on Rust, uh, you, and to be clear, you are directing the scenes. Yes. So when the, when the actors are, are outfitted with their revolvers and they're preparing to, to film the scene, you're the person that's there directing. Is that right? Yeah, I'm talking it through with the actors, yeah. Um, Did you have an opportunity to see Ms. Gutierrez um, engage in her armor duties by providing firearms to actors or retrieving those firearms? Yeah, I remember times uh, seeing her do that. I do, yes. Um, was there ever a time, well, let me ask you this. Did, did, when we talk about how the armor and the assistant director do a, are you familiar with the way that the armor and the assistant director are supposed to do a safety check of guns? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I have a pretty good understanding of it. Okay. Um, and what is your understanding of whether or not uh, the armor should load the gun in the presence of the assistant director? Ooh, to be honest, that I don't really know. Um, okay. I'm not sure if it's supposed to come to that moment loaded or if they're supposed to do it at the, in that exact moment. That I'm not certain. Let me ask you this. Did you ever see Ms. Gutierrez load a gun with dummy rounds in the presence of the actor or the assistant director? I mean, gosh, nothing that really sticks out to me. I remember times when she would call out what was in it, you know, but I don't, you know, I don't remember really seeing her specifically putting things in. Okay. Um, do you ever recall any safety checks where you saw Ms. Gutierrez shake rounds before loading them into the gun? I never saw anyone shake around, no. Thank you. What is your understanding of the overall I would say for lack of a better word the overall amount of power that the armorer has over the firearms and, and ammunition on the set? Well I would say that specifically since it's such a safety matter and it's such a specialized matter that there's really no one on set that should be able to override the armor in terms of the weapons, the ammunition, how they're handled, anything. What the armor says goes. And would that include the star actor and producer, Mr. Baldwin? It would include anybody, yeah. Okay. I want to ask you a little bit uh, about the COVID protocols <clears throat> that were in place on the set of rest. Mm -hmm. We understand that this was uh, during COVID. Tell us how, how that worked. Yeah, it was during COVID. Uh, we would come to set in the mornings. They would have, you'd get in a big line. They would have the people doing the, the testing. There was, I believe they had like a trailer there that were there also, like, there was a specific kind of testing you would do that would be more like the quick nasal swab and then there was the kind that would take longer to process. They would do both. Um, people were, uh, would mask, uh, particularly indoors, were encouraged to. Um, I think, you know, everyone tried to be extremely careful. And to my knowledge, we never had a positive test on, on the show. 
Okay. Uh, was there any kind of a requirement on the set uh, that people needed to leave, let's say, the church or another indoor filming area uh, to reduce the number of people inside due to COVID? Nothing I ever heard of, no. I was, there was, the people who had to be there had to be there, so. Um, I am going to, let, let me ask you, um, you, you wrote the script, so mm -hmm. are, are you familiar with uh, all of the scenes that were to be recorded? In this yep. movie, yep. Um, you understand now what dummy rounds are used for. Yeah, yeah. They're essentially you put them in so that if there's a close up on the gun, there is something that is in the gun that is inert that can't do anything, but looks like there's a bullet in the gun. <clears throat> to the best of your recollection, was there ever a close up scene? Uh, of an actor or a stuntman loading or unloading the lever action rifle that was assigned to Mr. Baldwin? No, there was not. Based on your understanding of the scenes in the script, can you think of any reason that dummy rounds would have been placed inside that uh, rifle for filming? No, I think if my memory serves, I believe the only thing that rifle was going to be used for it was there's one scene where it fires and accidentally kills somebody, but we were never going to have the rifle fire in any way because it's an underage actor in that scene holding the weapon, and so we were just going to CGI the the gun blast. Okay, and, and when you say CGI, just computer effects. You you put a fake gunshot in digitally in the, in the special effects process after you filmed. And hypothetically, if that rifle was gonna be used for actual firing, um, would it have blanks in it and not dummies? Your Honor, object. Approach. Um, to be clear, can you think of any reason, and, and I mean in terms of cinematography and what you understood about the filming uh, of the scenes, that that rifle needed to have dummy rounds? We wouldn't see them. I mean, dummies are... It's purely visual. If they go into the rifle, they disappear into the rifle, so you wouldn't see them, so you wouldn't need dummies in the rifle. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to take you to October 21st of 2021. Uh, can you explain to the jury how that day uh, began? 
Uh, yeah, we we got there early as we always did. It was still dark. Um, gaffer was waiting there for me with mittens and a hat for both me and Helena as he always did. And who was the gaffer? Serge Svetnoy. Okay. And uh, and we had realized that uh, I think it was six members of the camera team were going to be leaving. Um, and so we knew we were going to not get started really. We It was very early. I think uh, Helena knew that she, they were going to have to start finding other local folks that were available for work to get us there. And so things started a little later that day than they generally did. Um, and once, I don't remember exactly the number of people that were brought in uh, after the other team had left. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you right there. Sure. In, in your experience in the film industry, is it unusual for this kind of a disagreement to occur between production and the camera team? Mm, I, I haven't had it happen on one of the movies I've directed, but uh, I know other folks who have had that happen, yes. And were you particularly concerned about whether the cameramen that quit were disgruntled or had any malintent towards the, the filming? Uh, I wasn't concerned about anybody having any malintent. I think, you know, I think there was a, a decent amount of acrimony between them and the production or the production office and producers over some things that have been sort of going back and forth. I think they sort of, you know, they, as they should, they tried to sort of, you know, keep that thing away from me, but uh, I hear things, you know, what, what, what's going on? You know, you want, you want people to be happy. You want people to feel good about what they're doing, so. Did, did you, did you think that the camera crew's decision to leave was somewhat reasonable? You know, I don't know. It's, that's a tough one. I wouldn't want to answer for them. I, you know, I knew it was going to put us behind the eight ball a little bit, but then again, you know, people have their concerns. People have bills to pay. They have their own needs. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they, they did what they did. Um, I, when they left, I went and shook hands and I had no hard feelings and I, I don't, I hope they had no hard feelings toward me and said, I hope we work together again, because frankly, they were pretty darn good at what they did. Okay. But, uh, you know, I think, again, I'm not 100% privy to all the goings on there, but I think, you know, people have their concerns and the, and the things they need to do. I think they felt they did what was right, so. Okay. Um, so you get to set, you understand that you're gonna lose the camera crew, and I think we left off where yeah. uh, Ms. Hutchins was going to try to uh, fill some of those roles. Yeah, I think between you know Helena and I think the production office, they would start putting out some feelers in an urgent manner that we need, you know. And so then I, at some point, some folks came. I, I don't know exactly how many, there might've been three or four. We were gonna be down a camera that day because one of the folks that left was the A camera operator. And so we knew we were gonna be operating under only one camera for the rest of the day, which, I mean, sometimes you do only use one camera when you're filming, but you know, that's gonna slow you down because sometimes when you're filming, you can have two cameras catching something at once and now you're gonna to need to do that twice. So it's gonna take twice the time. Um, and so, yeah, we were sort of gearing up and, and girding ourselves for that and talking about our plan for the day, how we were going to go about this. Because it was already, schedule-wise, it was already going to be a difficult day. So what was the plan for the day? The plan for me, as I saw it, I, you know, I sort of took Dave, our first assistant director, aside and Helena and just said, look, I think we all understand when you look at this day as schedule, we're not going to make this. We're not going to, this is not going to happen. And what I don't want to do is start short changing the scenes that we have in front of us. What we're going to do is we are going to do the scenes that are in front of us. We're going to do them properly. We're going to work our way through. And whatever's left at the end of the day, we can't control that. That's left at the end of the day, and we'll have to figure out tomorrow, tomorrow. But today, we're going to do what we can. Okay. And so if you recall, 
approximately what time were you able to get filming underway? Mm. It might have been like nine something. I, I seem to remember nine something because that's, you know, you're getting going a couple hours late at that point. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and if you recall, what were, what were the first, uh, what, what were the scenes that were filmed uh, in, in, that bef- in that session before lunch? Yeah, we were sort of tucked into a corner of the town. We have, it's a scene where the head lawman in the movie, his name is, character's name is Wood. He brings a few other lawmen into town. So it's, it's a decent sized undertaking in that you've got, again, you've got animals. I think we had a mule or a donkey there and some other animals. We had horses, wagons, a lot of extras. And you have these three characters riding into town at a decent pace and then coming in. It was essentially, we had, it's before a scene and after a scene, if that makes sense. There, we were filming the first part of a scene where they ride into town. At a different time, we had already filmed the scene where they would walk in to have this business they were dealing with. And then we were filming again their exit. And during the filming of those scenes, were there any close-up shots of revolvers that would have made the use of dummy rounds appropriate that you can recall? We did no close-ups in those. It was wide versions of them riding into town and then getting off. It wasn't a lot of shots, to be honest, because you have something that big and pretty, you sort of tend to back up a little bit and show it off. And then at the when they were leaving, it was the character, I'll tell you exactly what it was, his foot goes into the holster, we come up with camera, to reveal him getting into his horse and onto his horse and two men behind him and then they ride out. That starts at what sort of more term as a medium shot and then becomes a wide shot as they leave. And were there any other scenes that were filmed prior to lunch other than that one? After we finished on that end of town, we moved up the road to the church and filmed a good amount of interior stuff in the church. And uh, the, the scenes inside the church, did those involve Mr. Baldwin? Yes. Um, and if you know, were those scenes filmed uh, in such close proximity that dummy rounds may be advisable? I think a few shots, yes. Okay. Yeah, and for other characters, too. Because we had also filmed the marshals coming in. Essentially, the scene is the young boy helps his grandfather in. We filmed that a few times. They see he sits him down in a church pew, and then the boy runs out to get help. And let me stop you. Yeah. The, the grandfather of the young is, boy. I'm sorry, is, Har- is Ali. It's Har- the character's name is Harlan Rust. And that's Mr. Baldwin's yeah, character. Yeah, and the boy, is, his character is called Lucas. Okay. So Lucas brings Rust in. Rust has been shot in a previous scene. He's bleeding. The boy's going to go try to find help. He runs out. Then the lawmen come in, which we filmed, them coming in, fanning out around the church, talking to the Rust character, and the Rust character slumped over in the pew. So we filmed most of, if not all, of the pieces of the lawmen coming in, looking that way. We filmed a good portion of the pieces of the characters, the Rust and Lucas coming in before that. Okay. We did that all before lunch. Okay, and after the filming of those scenes, um, what happened? Uh, after the filming of that part of the scene, uh, it was time for lunch. They called lunch. When they call lunch, where do you go? We had, uh, everyone tends to get in the vans and go back to base camp. I remember um, Alec was still there as people were clearing out, and he and I and Helena talked a little bit about what was still to come because we were going to pick literally right up where we left off after lunch. And people would go to uh, get in the, in the pass vans. It wasn't very far, but there was a decent sized hill they would have to go over. So they would just sort of, it would be faster to drive them in vans over to where we would have lunch. Okay. Um, and what happened when lunch was over? Uh, lunch was over. Everybody migrates back to the church and you pick up where you left off. Um, were you inside the church immediately after lunch was over? Yeah. I, yeah. Did you stay inside the church the entire time between when lunch ended and when the shooting occurred? No. No, I uh, at a certain point went outside of the church. And why were you doing that? So when we were setting up the camera angle, we were talking about what the shot was supposed to be. 
and forgive me if I overexplain this, but the scene is very tense, right? And so you achieve that through editing and camera angles. And so you want to see Rust laying, sitting there. Is he dead? Is he alive? The men coming closer, they're ordering him to give up. And then you cut to close ups and you're cutting from the character to the lawmen back and forth. And the first shot was supposed to essentially be the first moment we might realize that Rust is not in fact as injured as we might have thought. And so it was gonna be a close up on the weapon coming out of the holster. And so we had talked about that a little bit. Uh, Helena and, and I had talked and there's Reed there, Serge was there, they're talking about the lighting. And then at a certain point, it's time to set, just set the camera angle up. It's just, it's not a rehearsal yet. You're just sort of what they call auditioning the shot. Like, do you like this camera angle? Okay. And so once they do that, the camera was on the dolly which is a gigantically heavy piece of equipment. And it was in the middle of these, an aisle between pews. So the pews were here and the dollies in the middle. And when you're in a tight space like that, I generally, when they start moving the gear around, feel like I'm in the way. And so I got out of the way, went outside and I figured, well, I'll, we still had one monitor. There was no village anymore that day or that I'm aware of. Not, and not in the traditional sense that there would be monitors lined up and, but there was still a monitor that I could see the camera through. Where was, was that monitor? That was outside of the church. I don't remember if they had it on a stand or if it was on a cart. It was not a big one, but they were trying to get image up on the monitor of having come back from lunch. And after a time, the image was just not coming up. And so I decided before they get too far afield, if they're sort of setting this up in a way that I think isn't gonna work, I would like to at least stop them and say, no, no, let's move it here. And so that's when I went back inside to have a look. Um, so at any point in time, did you see Ms. Gutierrez enter the church with the, with the uh, firearm? No, it wasn't. I wasn't aware of her coming in or leaving or anything. There's just, the church was... You know, there are an enormous, there's an enormous amount going on. A million voices, it feels like. You know, the special effects guys are rigging things up in the roof to, for debris for later on. When the shooting starts, there'll be debris falling down. And there are people working the lights. There are people moving the cameras. There's, there's, just, there's a lot going on. And so I didn't really register that. Uh, do you have any idea who... Uh, provided Mr. Baldwin his uh, revolver for the scene? No, I mean, just beyond in a general sense about who's supposed to hand it off, but no, I didn't see anybody give it to him. Okay. Um, at some point, does Mr. Baldwin get his revolver? I mean, he clearly had it. The, I mean, I just, the interesting thing, I never saw him with it. I mean, he clearly had it because of what happened, but when I went in to look at the, to see what was going on with the camera angle, I remember there's sort of a big group kind of hovered around where he would be. He would be sitting in the pew. I just couldn't see him. I'm not the tallest guy in the world. And so I, what I wanted to do was get up behind Helena to try to sneak a look over her. At, there's a little tiny monitor on the side of the camera to at least see that to see what it was looking like, but I never even got a look at that. Okay, so explain to us uh, when, you're going, when you're going into the church and why and what you do and what happens. <clears throat> so I went inside again to see, to try to see what the angle was. There were a lot of voices. I heard Alec's voice. I heard Helena's voice. Everyone's sort of talking at once. I don't... <laughs> I don't have a clear memory of how long I was standing behind her. Um, I know I got up behind her to just to try to see on the monitor and uh, there was an incredibly loud bang that was not like the half and quarter loads you hear on a set. The, those are sort of, they're loud poofs and pops. This was deafening. And uh, I, um, it felt like somebody had taken a baseball bat to my shoulder. I remember that distinctly and sort of stumbling back and shouting. I don't remember exactly what I said. Um, were you able to see Ms. Hutchins at that time? 
I did. I, I remember sort of stumbling back and I either fell to my knees or I was sitting and I distinctly remember her being lowered to the ground. People had her uh, sort of by either side. And I, I still didn't quite know what had happened. Nothing made sense. I, I remember initially thinking, had she been startled by it? And they were sitting her down as, as a result. And then I, I saw the blood on, on her back. And to the best of your recollection, what happened after that? Um, it got very chaotic. Um, I remember them laying me down. I remember them laying her down next to me. Although we were sort of facing in opposite directions, my head was this way, her head was that way. Um, I remember a lot of panic. Um, I still just couldn't figure out what had happened. I just, I thought, was there something that had been stuck in the barrel that came out? But just nothing made sense. Um, I remember our dolly grip, uh, Ross, coming to sort of grab me and trying to call me. And then Matt Hemmer came in. And between the two of them, I remember they sort of tended to me and were pulling up and just trying to find out where there was a hole. Um, Do you recall, Mr. Souza, at any point in time uh, during that general time after uh, the gun went off, um, having any kind of an interaction with Ms. Gutierrez? I remember at one point looking up and her standing there with a f another person or a few other people and she was looked distraught uh, just and I remember her saying I'm sorry I'm sorry Joel and I remember somebody just screaming at her and they just ushered her out um, okay I, um, at some point in time were you uh, taken from the scene yeah I you know, it's funny, they, when I hear later about how long we laid there, it felt like five minutes. And I remember, I remember looking over and her looking back at me. Um, and she had the biggest brown eyes I've ever, I've ever seen. Um, and then, but I, when they, they, I don't remember who they took out first. They put me on a, some kind of stretcher and rolled, rolled me out. And where did they take you? They told me they were going to take me to the near, they just said they were going to take me to the hospital. And I kept uh, begging them to take me where she was, but they said they couldn't and that they would later. And uh, they eventually took me to, I think it's Christus St. Vincent, I think that's what it's called, in Santa Fe. And when you were at the hospital, did you have an understanding that you had been actually shot by a bullet? No. No. I mean, I knew something got me, but the, they kept saying, they kept talking about this bullet, and I... It just it could not compute for me. I just kept saying, you don't understand. No, 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 this was a movie set. You don't, that's not possible. You don't get it. And they kept saying, no, 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 it is. And I just keep insisting, you don't understand because this is not possible. It's just not possible that there's a live round. It's not, it just can't. And then they eventually maybe grew tired of my protesting about it because they showed me the x-ray of my back and there was a very large bullet in it. Okay. And sir, do you know whether Ms. Gutierrez was inside the church at the time that the gun went off? I don't know. In your experience, would you have had an expectation that she 
would have been in the church. Yeah, the armor would be where the gun is. Okay. I'll pass the witness. Cross it down. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. Morning. I have a few questions for you. Sure. Um, so, Mr. Souza, I think before uh, you testified that before the rest movie, your experience with firearms was on Crown Vic. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, more or less. Yeah. Okay. And that was a movie you directed. I directed and wrote Crown Vic. Yeah. And you wrote that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that I think you said had a couple scenes involving firearms. Is that right? Well, in where guns were fired, there wasn't, yeah, there were a few, yeah. So you had an armorer on that set? Was that armor full-time? He was there for the days that the guns were going to be used or fired, yeah. Is that the only occasion you've ever worked on a set with an armorer? Yeah. Okay. So is it fair to say your experience with uh, working with armorers was fairly limited? Prior to Up to that point, yeah. Okay. Um, so are you familiar with the SAG uh, safety rules where if the armor or prop master are not present, a responsibility falls on the AD? I don't think I ever really reviewed the SAG rules. Um, I don't think I would have been aware of what, a, what the procedure would have been if the armor wasn't there. I think my assumption was always that the armor was supposed to be there. Okay, and you made an assumption, but if there's a SAG rule that indicates that responsibility then falls on the AD, are you, are you aware of that? Uh, that's not a rule that I'm aware of, no. Okay, so you have not reviewed the SAG rules with respect to armors in general, or, no. or firearm safety in general? No, I'm not a SAG member, so. Okay. But no, I haven't, no. Okay, so um, if uh, in the church at that time, uh, Miss Gutierrez Reed was not present, and you, you don't remember. I don't. Okay, uh, but Mr. Halls was. He was the first assistant director, correct? Uh, he was the first assistant director. Yes. Now you don't remember. Um, I think he said seeing who handed Mr. Baldwin the firearm. That's correct. And I think he said, sir, you don't remember Mr. Baldwin even having the revolver. You didn't see it. I mean, he had to have had it, but... I know he had it before oh. lunch. Yeah. I know he had to have had it for obvious reasons, but I don't... I didn't see him have it, holding it in that. I just... It never got to that. Okay. <clears throat> so before lunch, did you see who handed Mr. Baldwin the revolver? No. I remember... I remember at some point before lunch hearing Dave call out Colt Gun, but I don't remember who handed it to him. Okay. And that's Dave Halls? Yeah. And Mr. Halls called out cold gun before lunch that you remember? As I remember that, yeah. Okay. Uh, was the blocking uh, done before lunch as well for that scene? Well, I mean, the, there's a lot going on in that scene. We had sort of gotten to a certain point in it. What was coming next, we had not practiced before. What was coming next was essentially just picking up where we left off. But that was what's called an insert. It was an okay. insert shot. Okay, sir, so and this insert shot, this was going to be after lunch? This so, was our first shot up after lunch. Okay. And was this an insert shot of an extreme close-up on, on the hand as it's pulling from the holster? Yeah, it was sort of, it was, what I had in mind was, and I, I talked about it a little bit before, but you have this, the hand kind of coming out like this, pulling it, yeah. And, and when you just demonstrated that, you had the, your hand coming across and pulling in front of you? Correct. Okay. Because that's where he had, his thing was up here, so it would have naturally been going that way. And, and do you know whether from the script, whether that uh, firearm was supposed to be pointed towards the camera? Well, I mean, it's not a matter of the script, really. For that specific shot, it was literally just supposed to be the gun being pulled out sideways. Okay, sir, and when you demonstrated that, you did not have your hand pointed forward? No. Okay. So in that extreme close-up shot, it was just supposed to be pulled out in front? Just, right. Okay. It was very short. Okay. And was that uh, designed to be like an insert to build tension 
in, in the scene? Yeah, you cut back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I understand. Um, so at the time that that occurred, um, after lunch, when you're doing that extreme close-up scene, was that called a blocking? Uh, yeah, it's sort of blocking for camera, yeah, to see, you know, they want to see where the focus needs to be, you know, and how it's going to look, which way it's going to, which way the camera's going to be oriented, essentially. And not, when I said auditioning the shot, it's essentially the same thing as the blocking, camera blocking for the shot. So, in essence, um, that, that scene is just setting up. There's not even filming going on at that point. Correct. Okay. So, with regard to that, um, did Mr. Baldwin, did you ever hear Mr. Baldwin insist on having his revolver? For that scene, not that I'm aware of. No. Okay. It, did you were you aware that generally during the movie he liked to have his hero guns? I don't think it's unusual for actors to like that thing. I mean, again, in hindsight, it would have been easy to sort of say focus on that and think about it. At the time, I don't know that I had a sort of a clear understanding of that or not. Okay. I just don't want to speculate. Yeah. Right, absolutely. So your your knowledge of, of that kind of uh, firearm and, and in that particular scene, at that time it wasn't very extensive. Right. Okay. So in that scene there's a blocking and it's just going to be an extreme close-up. Um, you are paying attention to the camera, as I understand. You're trying to look at the monitor. Right. I did, Like I said, I didn't... I wanted to see what the angle was. Okay. But since monitor wasn't up yet I thought well I should go inside and try to catch a look at it there because if it doesn't fit what I need to come next there are very specific pieces I need okay and if it doesn't fit what comes next we should stop you know there was not a lot of time to waste that day so absolutely the day would start it off behind yeah um, so is it fair to say that your attention was focused on trying to get the right kind of camera angle for that extreme close-up uh, yeah, because it's there's not real there's no real performance at play there. It's more of a technical exercise. It's just right. here's what I need to happen in this close up to so that in the editing room so that I can get this to work. So at that time, and taking it back to that that time, you're more focused on trying to get the scene set up. Your focus is not on looking around to see if Miss Gutierrez Reed is in the church. Is that fair? I'd say that's fair, correct. Okay. And and so at the time. It did. Did it occur to you at all to look around and see if the armor is there, and if not, to to call her, semi call her? No, I wouldn't say that it did. Okay, and because at that time there wasn't even going to be uh, more than just pulling out of a holster, right? That's correct. Okay, so you didn't hear. Well, you didn't know she was in the church, so. Obviously, you didn't hear anybody go get her or call her back in. Uh, like I said, there were so many voices going on. I, you know, I'm just trying to focus on what I can focus on at that point. Absolutely. It, you described it, and I kind of got the picture in my head. It was a little bit, it's um, all kinds of things are going on at that moment. There's people trying to set up the cameras and tell me if I'm wrong. Or why don't you tell it in your words? Well, there's just a, a lot of people moving in a lot of different directions. There's the the special effects people hanging what are called poppers from the ceiling. They're sort of, what I talk about, they will, during the gunfight, they will pop and then debris will come raining down. There are people positioning lights. There are people moving cameras. There are wardrobe people in and out. There are, you know, there's just a, a lot. It's, yeah. uh, you know, and it, under normal circumstances, it's quite a thing to watch, frankly. I also want to ask you on the long rifle, the Henry rifle. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have much knowledge of how the Henry rifle works? Beyond what I'd read about it when I was writing the script, no. I know it's a lever action, mm -hmm. and that's what appealed to me in a visual sense. And uh, but beyond that, not really. No. Okay. Do you have much experience in general with, with knowing types of firearms, how they function? No, outside of movies, I have nothing to do with guns. Okay. Now, on that Henry rifle, you know there was one scene in the script where Mr. Baldwin's character is supposed to come out of the shack or whatever the structure mm -hmm. is, and he's firing at the lawman? You remember that, sir? Right. And that involved, uh, did that involve his hero gun, the, the Henry rifle? 
Uh, he was carrying it. He was not going to be firing it. It just was, it proved impractical. Okay. Yeah. So do you know that the Henry rifle is made such that there's a plunger on the bottom and when the rounds are loaded, you can see or not see if rounds are in that rifle? No, he said, I, I'm not any kind of expert on a rifle. Okay. A uh, part of the armor's duties, would you agree with um, there to be there um, also for if the particular weapon Mr. Baldwin's holding needs to look like it's loaded, that's their job. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. Because you got to have a realistic feel for the audience. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's the entire reason dummies exist. Okay. And so if if the Henry rifle, if you can see at the bottom whether rounds are loaded uh, or dummy rounds are loaded or not, um, that would be something that would um, you would want the armor to handle. If it was required for the scene, yes. Okay. And in that particular scene, Mr. Baldwin is going to confront these lawmen? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, with regard to dummies, I think you said before this, uh, before Rust, you weren't very familiar with dummies either? I wasn't really familiar with the term of it. I think, you know, I guess it's, you know, I would have assumed that there was, if I'd watch a Western and you see something and they have a gun pointed and there's something at the end of the, I'm sorry, there's something in the, in the cylinders or whatever those are called, I think I would assume there's something in there. I wouldn't quite know what it is. But, okay. Yeah. And you talked about on the second go round in your direct, um, you completed the, the rest filming? We did. And on that second filming, did you, you use wooden dummies? Uh, I wouldn't even call them dummies because they didn't ever get loaded into anything. When there was a situation where we had to match previous shots, like on a bandolier where somebody had what would look like bullets, the armorer on that go-round had made them out of wood and then painted them and tucked them into the bandoliers. Okay. And you know that the purpose of a dummy, a dummy round, is to look very like a live round. Yeah. Okay. When it comes to safety on the set, uh, who is the person uh, in general that's responsible? Well, I think in, in a general sense, I mean, the first assistant director is the safety officer on set. Um, but beyond that, I think it also, you know, there's a set is generally a real, if you see something, say something thing. So everybody is responsible to some degree to try to make sure there's a safe work environment in terms of our safety officer and who, I mean, generally the first AD is the safety officer. And, and, and what you just said, and first AD is in charge of that, but if somebody, anybody on set sees something unsafe, they should say something. Yes, I think an example would be if there's an extension cord that's not taped down or there's you know something that someone could hit their head on or something. You, you want to try to head those things off. There are a lot of sharp corners on movie sets. Now, ultimately, uh, with regard to safety, the producers are where the buck stops. Do you agree with that? I think the producers are the people who write the checks are generally where the buck stops on everything in life. I don't think a movie set is any different. One other portion, um, Mr. Baldwin, when you talked about earlier about the armor saying something to him, did you ever communicate uh, to the armor if she had issues that she needed to confront Mr. Baldwin or tell Mr. Baldwin or did you ever say anything about that? I don't think we ever talked about that. I think she and I might have had two conversations all told, okay. but that wouldn't, wouldn't have been one of them. Okay. And would you agree with me, Mr. Baldwin has a fairly strong personality in that movie? Uh, sure. I think, yeah. And we saw some clips on that. Um, finally, you mentioned that the day three, you felt good about how that went. And mm -hmm. uh, it was an amazing team of professionals, I think you said that pulled together and did a good job. Is that fair? Yeah, I think uh, we had a very strong crew. And, and Ms. Gutierrez-Reed also performed very well that day. Yeah, on that day I didn't take any issue. Yeah. I was happy with everybody.
Okay. All right, Your Honor, may I have just a moment? I have nothing further, Your Honor. Redirect. Just briefly, Mr. Souza. Mm -hmm. Do you recall a single scene that was going to be filmed in the movie where anyone was loading the rifle with ammunition? No. Do you, re do you recall a single scene in the movie that was going to be filmed where anyone was cycling ammunition through the rifle? No. I don't have anything further, thank you. You're excused, thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Can we approach real quick? Yeah, but we're not taking a lunch break. What's up?
right, state your next witness. Uh, the state calls Emory Chacon. Face the judge, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, can you just move a little closer to the microphone and speak into the microphone, sir? There we go. Thank you. Would, uh, would you state your name? Name is Emery Chacon. And in October of 2021, how were you employed? I worked the front desk at the Inn at Santa Fe. Um, and during that same month, uh, did you uh, befriend uh, Hannah Gutierrez? I did. And during your friendship with her, did you have an opportunity to be, well, well let, me, let me back up. Um, was how did you get to know Ms. Gutierrez through your work at the hotel? Um, well, I work the second shift, so I check in guests. It's my job to be polite, friendly to guests. So being polite, friendly, started small talk. Was Ms. Gutierrez a guest at the hotel? Yes. Uh, do you know if other crew members from the set of Rust were also staying at that hotel? There were other crew members. Um, and at any point in time during your friendship with Ms. Gutierrez, did you have an opportunity to uh, be in her hotel room? Yes. Um, and, and if you recall, approximately how many times would you have been in her hotel room? Mm. can't really recall I just maybe a handful of times handful of times okay um, and uh, when you were in her hotel room uh, did you ever take notice of any boxes of ammunition yes and I want to be clear were you are you familiar with uh, guns and ammunition at all? I am. Um, based on your experience, were you able to determine whether the ammunition was for pistols or rifles or anything? I saw what looked like maybe a couple of rifle rounds, maybe shotgun shells maybe one pistol round. And when you say that you saw the rounds, were they in boxes? Uh, there were a few that were not in boxes. They were sitting on the counter in the room. And to the best of your recollection, were any of the rounds that were not in boxes um, pistol rounds? One. One was a pistol round. Do you recall approximately when you saw, and, and let me ask you, other than the rounds that were not in boxes, did you see boxes inside, did you also see boxes of ammunition in the room? Yes. And do you know whether the ammunition that you saw was real ammunition or fake ammunition for the movie. I don't know the physical difference between fake ammunition and, and real ammunition. Understood. Um, do you recall approximately when you would have noticed the ammunition in her hotel room? It was maybe towards an evening in terms of like exactly what day I can't give. Do you know whether it was towards the beginning of her stay or the end of her stay? Towards the beginning. Did you see the ammunition in her room on more than one occasion? No. Just one occasion? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'll pass the witness. Pass it to you. Thank you. 
So, Mr. Tricone, I, I think you said you were a hotel uh, desk clerk? Yes, sir. And, and, sir, what hotel was that? The NS Santa Fe. Okay. Um, as part of being a desk clerk at the hotel, did you check uh, uh, check Miss Gutierrez Reed in when she started her stay? I did. Now, you did not know her before that, right? No. So you just came acquainted <clears throat> with her from her being a patron and, and coming to the hotel and you checking her in to stay there? That is correct. Um, you said she st uh, she at the start of her uh, stay is when you uh, believe you saw the um, ammunition. What day was that? I can't recall. Do you recall if that was in uh, September um, of 2021, October of 2021? Do you have any idea? Mm, maybe mid-September? Late September? About. Okay. Okay, and you were uh, up in her room. I, I know that you all texted, that you had texted Miss Gutierrez Reed, is that right? Yes. And did you um, go to a movie with her one time? Yes. Now, after that, didn't you want to uh, keep texting her and, and have a different type of relationship with her? Quite possibly. Okay. That's, that's what you wanted, isn't it, at that time? Not too sure how it would have worked out, but perhaps. Okay. And and she, it was pretty clear from her text back that that's not what she wanted to do, right? Yes. Okay. Um, over a period of time, you kept texting her and she finally, she quit text. she just quit texting. Is that fair? Yep. Okay. Now, I know that you said on... Uh, direct that you can't tell the um, live ammunition from a blank ammunition for example is that true that's correct okay and you also probably wouldn't be able to tell a dummy round from a live round right correct now these boxes that you had mentioned do you remember what color they were I remember they were kind of a army green hard plastic Okay, and, and you just don't know um, exactly what was in them or what they contained? No. Okay. And in late September, you're aware that the filming had not started yet for the movie, or do you have any knowledge of that? No, I, Okay. Do you have any knowledge of when the movie started filming? No knowledge. Okay. You're going to have nothing further. Thank you. Any redirect? No, you're welcome. All right, you're excused. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. The state calls Wyatt Mortensen. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Thank you. Have a seat. Talking to the microphone. Good morning, sir. Morning. Uh, go ahead and state your name for the record. Wyatt Mortensen. Um, Mr. Mortensen, what do you do for a living? I'm a wrangler and stuntman. Explain to the jury what what it means to be a wrangler. Uh, we take care of the horses on the movie set. We give actors riding lessons, and we make sure that nothing bad happens to the horses or anybody that's around them. Were you employed as a wrangler on the set of Rust? I was. In your capacity as a wrangler on the set of Rust, how frequently were you on set? Uh, pretty much every day. Okay. And uh, in addition to taking care of horses, 
Um, were you also in some of the scenes that were filmed? I was. And in what capacity were you in those scenes? Um, I would dress out and drive wagons or ride horses in the background, some stunts. Okay, great. Um, can you give the, the ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, an idea about your background and experience in the film industry as a wrangler and or stuntman? Yes. Uh, I just got in the industry when I turned 18, which was four years ago. And since then, I've been working pretty frequently on two dozen films, give or take. As, uh, as a wrangler in stunts, I've worked with numerous actors and many different uh, people that are big in the movie industry. Mr. Mortensen, prior to working on the set of Rust, did you work on any other movies that had guns and, and armorers? I did. Um, do you recall approximately how many films you worked on that had guns and armorers prior to Rust? Uh, about every movie. I've worked on. Okay. Every movie. Yes, ma'am. Can you give us an idea of how many movies that would have been prior to Rust? Um, prior to Rust, maybe five, I'd say. Okay. Um, and did you have an opportunity uh, while you were on set to see um, Ms. Gutierrez perform her work as the set armorer? I did. And. Was there anything about the manner in which she performed her work that caused you concern? Nothing directly. Um, let me ask you this. Do you recall... Um, can you describe to the ladies and gentlemen of the, uh, of the jury uh, what... how she uh, brought the guns and ammunition two set from the prop cart. Just carry them by hand. Did that seem unusual to you? Um, nothing too unusual. Uh, no. Um, Mr. Mortensen, do you, uh, hang on just one second. Do you recall an incident where a rifle was lost on the set? I do. Um, can you explain to us how a rifle was lost or what you recall about that? We were doing a stunt in the middle of town and after we were done, uh, I was asked if I've seen a rifle anywhere on set. Um, do you recall who asked you that? I do not. Okay. Um, do you know whether the rifle was found? I don't. Um, Mr. Mortensen, uh, do you... Did you ever take notice of guns and ammunition being left unattended on set? I did. Can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you saw with regard to guns and ammunition being left unattended. I seen guns and ammunition on a small cart that was left on the set periodically. And when you say periodically, um, how frequently do you think you saw guns and ammunition left unattended on that cart? Most days that we had guns. Um, in your experience with armorers on movie sets, did that seem unusual to you? Uh, yes. And if you recall, or, or if, you, if you can estimate, approximately how long would the guns and ammunition be left unattended on that cart? I can't truly recollect. Sir, do you, do you recall in this case having a, uh, a pre-trial interview where you had to show up and talk to us about your testimony? Via Zoom, yes. Yeah, that's right, via Zoom. 
Uh, do you recall specifically what you said during that interview about uh, approximately how long the guns and ammunition would be left unattended? I can't remember. Would it refresh your memory if I showed you a transcript of our conversation? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. May I? Yes. And if you want me to scroll down, Did that refresh your memory? Mm, yes, it did. Okay. Um, can, can you answer my question now? Yeah. Oh. Uh, close to an hour or so. Yeah, sometimes more. Do you have personal experience with uh, firearms? Uh, yes, ma'am. Can you tell the difference between real firearms and uh, replica or fake firearms? Um, if. I'm handed one and I can see it closely, yes. Do you know whether the uh, firearms that you saw regularly left unattended on the prop cart were real? Uh, yes, most of them seemed real. Okay, and when you say they seemed real, how would you know that? Uh, just because most of the guns on the movie set were real. And did you see uh, scenes that were filmed on the movie uh, where the guns would shoot blanks? Yes. Do fake guns fire blanks? Mm, no. Okay, only real guns fire blanks, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and sir, did you um, take note during your, your time on the set of Rust, um, did you notice whether or not Ms. Gutierrez's uh, conduct as an, as an armor with regard to handing firearms to actors and taking firearms away from actors when a scene was over. Do you, do you recall taking note of that? Mm, yes. Can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, uh, what, if anything, you noticed about uh, the manner or, or, or uh, how quickly Ms. Gutierrez would remove real firearms from actors when a scene was over? It would depend on the scene and who the actors were. Um, do you recall uh, taking note that when a scene would be over, she would not immediately collect the firearms from the actors. Mm, yes. Did that stand out to you? Yes. Why? Every other show I'd been on previous to that, the armor would hand the gun right before the scene and take it away right after. And that was not Ms. Gutierrez's practice? Uh, not that I can recollect. Okay. And, sir, do you have uh, personal knowledge and experience with uh, revolvers? Um, fairly decent. Um, do you recall taking note of the manner in which Ms. Gutierrez would conduct the barrel check of the revolvers? Um, there was a few moments that I did notice, yes. Okay. Uh, so. But first of all, I want you to kind of explain to the jury what your understanding is of uh, why a barrel check is done and how it should be done. Well, from my experience, uh, the reason... Sure.
Mr. Mortensen, let's proceed. Um, did you notice anything that caught your eye about the way that Ms. Gutierrez would conduct uh, the barrel checks? Mm, yes. Okay, a and um, what did you notice specifically? Um, can you describe specifically? Uh, well, uh, let, let me do this. Do, do you recall discussing this during the interview that we did with you over Zoom? I believe so, yes. Um, do you recall exactly what you, what you said to us that day? I think so, yeah. Um, do you need it? Do you need to see it to have your memory refreshed at all? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Twenty-one. And take your time. Oh. Mr. Mortensen, did that refresh your memory? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can, can you answer my question now? I can. Um, so there would be m moments on the set, and one that I can truly recollect was uh, she took the gun from uh, Alec, and to check to see if the the gun was clean, which there's a process that armors do, and can, I, can, can you tell the, the jury in, in your experience what that process is? Yeah. In my experience, you always make sure you check uh, if a gun is clean or how many rounds are inside the gun. But uh, what you can do is you open the cylinder, and this is speaking with uh, single action pistols, and you take the cylinder out. And because blanks have a lot of debris that comes out with the gunpowder, you check the barrel sometimes to just see if it anything is lodged in there because that can shoot out with the gunpowder. And you open the cylinder and you can look down the barrel and if the cylinder is open, there's it's impossible to be shot or anything bad happen because uh, you can see straight through and you see daylight through the, the barrel of the gun. And what caught your eye about the way that Ms. Gutierrez did those uh, barrel checks? Uh, when she looked, the cylinder was closed. And so in your experience, it, when she looks and the cylinder is closed, um, what would she be able to see? Nothing. I'll pass the witness. <laughs> Cross-exam. Mr. Mortensen, isn't it true that you can see light through that barrel just by pulling back the hammer? Not that I know of. Not that you know of? Um, you're not an armor, are you? No, ma'am. And you've never worked as an armor on any movie, have you? No, ma'am. Um, in fact, in the filming of Rust, you, you were a wrangler, right? Yes, ma'am. Your responsibility is animals, right? Yes, ma'am. Horses? Yes, ma'am. Donkeys? No. You weren't responsible for the donkey? We, I thought we heard testimony about a donkey. That wasn't you, right? Uh, not that I can recollect. Okay. Um, and in fact, during the rust filming, isn't it true that you didn't even wear a real firearm? You had a replica rubber gun, right? Um, not that I can recollect. You don't recollect if you were a, a robber, if you had a fi real firearm on rust? Is that what you're saying? I, I can't remember if I had even a gun belt on. 
Okay. Um, in any time, at any time when you would have a gun on rust, wasn't it a rubber one? Mm, not that I can recollect. So you don't remember any, you don't remember if you had a real gun or a rubber gun on this movie set. Is that what you're saying? It? I can remember it holding both a live gun and a rubber gun, but... On the filming of Rust? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, now, in your direct testimony, one of the things I thought I wrote down that I heard you say was, um, there is nothing directly about Miss Gutierrez' work on that set that caused you concern. Do you remember telling the jury that in direct? Mm, yes. Okay. Um, and when you saw these guns on top of that that cart uh you weren't right over the prop cart right you were you were further away from that beside it um were you even able to tell if these were non-functioning or functioning firearms not that i could tell okay so uh in in your um have you ever seen on any of the movies you've worked on a part-time armor armor never And in the filming, in this filming on Rust, was there a time when horses ever got loose? Yes. And would you agree with me that that was an extremely dangerous situation? Uh, I'll object to... Oh, I'm sorry. Let's approach. Okay. Mr. Morrison, do you need me to repeat the question? Um, no. Okay, so can you answer the question? Uh, yes. So, uh, so ho horses, would you, it, it is a dangerous thing to have horses on set, right? Yes. And you were the one responsible for wrangling those, right? Yes. Okay. Do you recall a time on Rust when you had a problem getting paid on time? Mr. Mortensen, I'll, I'll re-ask the question here. So, do you ever recall a time on Rust when you had a problem getting paid on time? Um, I can't truly recollect. Would it refresh your memory to take a look at your um, pre-trial interview transcript? Yeah, yes please. Okay, just a sec.
first witness. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So was there ever a time on bus that you recall not being paid on time? Uh, yes, at the very beginning. Okay. Just a second, Your Honor. Have you ever testified in court before? No, ma'am. Um, I want to be clear. Did you see guns left unattended on the prop cart after shooting scenes that involved the firing of blank ammunition? Yes. Thank you. I don't have anything further. All right, this witness is excused. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, we're going to take our lunch break. Uh, please be back at um, one one ten. Um, okay, downstairs at one ten. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Thank you. All rise.
Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Uh, have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Ma'am, go ahead and state your full name for the record. My name is Sherilyn Schaefer. Ms. Schaefer, how are you currently employed? I am employed as an EMT in the film industry, a medic. Can you just explain to the jury the situation, the, the connection between movie sets and medics? Is a medic always on a movie set, and if so, why? Usually, if it's a union show, a medic is always on set. Um, for the potential that there could be something dangerous that happens. Um, but 99% of the time, we are in charge of making sure the actors, or not necessarily the actors, but the crew, um, have sunscreen, bug spray, Advil, electrolytes. Uh, if it's hot out, we make sure everyone stays hydrated. If it's cold, we hand out hot hands. Um, that's the majority of it. If somebody gets a splinter or a cut, we take care of those as well. Um, if somebody gets injured enough that they need to go to get stitches or be seen, we bandage them up, we send them off. Um, and then we are in charge of the, um, the paperwork that goes with the production to make sure that the uh, injury can be uh, to go through workers' comp so that it's not coming out of the, the crew or whoever's um, insurance. Okay. Um How long have you worked generally in the film industry? Um, I started in the film industry in 2008. Or, I'm sorry, 2009. Okay. And um, how long have you worked as a medic in the film industry? Since 2014. And can you summarize for the jury what your uh, medical training consisted of? That allowed you to be qualified for this position. <clears throat> I'm a licensed EMT. All right. Um, Ms. Schaefer, approximately do, since 2009, if you can guesstimate for us approximately how many uh, films have you worked on? Uh, film and TV, sure. Um, Forty plus. Okay, and of those, can you guesstimate for us again approximately how many had real firearms and an armor on set? Maybe ten, twelve. Um was the handling of firearms by the armor on the set of rust different than what you were used to? Yes. Can you describe to the jury what you noticed, how you thought it was different? I noticed uh, the armorer on rust did not um, secure the weapons as a normal armorer would or an armorer on productions I've worked on before would normally um, the weapon would be secured until it was time for the actor or stunt actor to need it um, and then the armorer would go to their generally a locked cabinet um, grab the weapon um, take it to the actor or stunt actor uh, with the first AD sometimes the stunt coordinator depending on who's who's there open the weapon empty it um, if it needs to be emptied, show the actor uh, or stunt actor the the um, the type of, of bullet, I guess you would call it, that's going to be in the gun. Show it that it's not real, um, and then or essentially check it in front of the actor and the first AD to make sure that everyone's uh, comfortable with it, uh, and then hand it over to that performer um, for the shot for whatever shot they they are shooting. And just to be clear, what you just described was what you are accustomed to. That is correct. Uh, can you explain to the jury uh, what, uh, how, how that procedure worked on the set of rust? Um, 
a lot of times um, when I would notice, I would notice our armorer um, hand the guns over to the actors, sometimes checking them, sometimes not. Um, it, generally, once the scene is over, you would remove the weapon. Um, the armorer would remove the weapon from the actor and resecure it until it is needed again. Uh, on Rust, that did not happen um, a good majority of the time. The actor still remained uh, in possession of the weapon, whether it was in their holster or in their hands. And um, can you kind of explain to the jurors how long the actors would be left with the weapons in their possession uh, after the scene and maybe discuss a little bit about how long it takes to do a turnaround. Okay, there were, um, there were a few times where, you know, it, they would have the, the weapon for a, a minute or two or so after uh, we had cut, but then there'd be other times where we would be turning around and, and that's where the camera position changes. Like if we're looking at somebody and we turn around, then we're gonna look the other direction at the actor. Um, that can take, uh, depending on all the moving parts, 20, 30 minutes, um, where they would still be in possession of the weapon. And I just want to be clear, did you testify that you saw uh, Ms. Gutierrez provide actors with weapons without conducting a safety check? That is correct. Did you ever have an occasion to notice uh, whether or not any of the actors on the set of the movie did their own safety checks? There were some times that the um, the actors would would open their weapons and look, you know, see either while it was being reloaded or not, um, looking at opening it up and looking at it. And generally, on a film set, you would not do that without the armorer present in front of you. Um, and if you did, then the armorer would need to be called back to ch to recheck that weapon in front of you. Um. So when the actors would do their own safety checks, was Ms. Gutierrez uh, participating in that? Uh, sometimes she was near, sometimes she wasn't. I don't recall exactly all the time. Uh, I didn't notice a lot, but there were some times where she could have been close by or not, but she was not directly in front of the actor. Okay. Um, and it wasn't every actor. It was you know just a couple here and there. Okay. Um, did you ever take note of how Ms. Gutierrez would load ammunition into her fanny pack? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Schaefer, do you recall the question? Could you repeat it again, please? Did you ever take note of how Ms. Gutierrez would uh, transfer ammunition from uh, boxes to her fanny pack? Yes, <clears throat> there was one occasion that I did see that. Uh, can you describe what you saw for the jury? So the, the, there would be um, the boxes that had the, a styrofoam with um, the ammunition inside of it um, and there were times I would see her take or this one time I saw her take the box and kind of tip it a little bit and use her fingers to put some in and then hand it back I believe to um, Miss Zachary uh, and get another box and do the same thing put more in put it back get another box put more in put it back so we're mixing multiple rounds inside a, a different and again I don't know what they were um, but mixing different rounds for different weapons. There were some short ones, some long ones. So during this um, instance where you saw uh, Ms. Gutierrez load the fanny pack directly from the boxes, 
if you recall, would she take the time to check every round to make sure that it was inert? No. All right. Um, in your experience in the film industry, um, does the armor always stay with the firearm? Yes. Or within proximity, be able to visually see. You mean when the actor has the, the weapon? Correct. Yeah, to be able to visually see. Um, was that the case on the set of Rust? No, not always. Um, I'm going to shift gears and direct your attention to October 21st of 2021. Uh, if you can just kind of walk us through, walk the jury through, um, how that day went and what you recall, you can start before the lunch hour and then we'll kind of move through it, okay? Okay. Um, about 6, 6.30 was my call time that morning and that's what time I, uh, that I needed to be on set. Um, I arrived on set, um, I, well I arrived to base camp first, grabbed breakfast. I, I don't remember if we had a COVID test that day or not, but then I went up to set. Um, and I have, um, I have a trauma bag that I take with me and I have a, a box and a stand that has, inside the box will have the, the um, emergency, it will have tissue, it'll have cough drops, it'll have those sorts of things that a crew member might want, as well as containers of um, sunscreen and, and bug spray because at that time we had the sun and bugs. Um, so I went and I set my stuff down at the middle of the town and um, on the radio, there was a little bit of noise about the camera department being behind schedule. Um, and I had asked somebody, I'm not sure who, one of our, um, either our, one of our other ADs or one of our PAs on set, a production assistants on set, I had asked what was going on and they had said that the camera department uh, was not ready to go um, and wouldn't be ready to go on time. Um, I generally, I'm friends with the majority of everybody on set. I've worked with everybody a lot. And so I went over to where the camera truck was to kind of see if I could see what was going on or talk to anybody about what was going on because I knew that they had had some issues with the production. And um, I noticed that they were packing up all their equipment. Um, and, um, you know, so I watched them do that for a little while, but then I had to go back to setting everything else up that I had to set up. And uh, at some point in time, um, our first AD, uh, Dave Halls, had called a, um, for a safety meeting that morning, um, which was rare. Um, and it was more of a meeting to kind of get the crew back together again, because we were all kind of spread out and, and trying to figure out what was going on that morning. And, um, and so he, he um, you know, in the safety meeting, he just said that we were going to have a... Um, I, I'm assuming, okay, sorry. I can say what it is. Uh, Ms. Schaefer, without saying what anyone said, can you summarize for the jury what your understanding was of the purpose for that meeting? The purpose of that meeting was to um, get the crew back together as we were scattered um, to try to get the, the day started. We were already so far behind with the camera crew leaving. And um, when, when scenes are being filmed, on the set, are you present every time a scene is being filmed? 95% of the time, unless okay. I need to use the restroom or, or something. Okay. Um, uh, were scenes being filmed that morning before lunch? Yes. And were you present for those? Yes. 
do you recall uh, if any of those scenes uh, involved the use of firearms? I'm not sure about the first scene. I, I don't remember what we shot. The second part was before lunch, right after we moved up to the church. We had a scene. Um, I'd, I'd like to say that it used weapons. I, I, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Uh, did you, during that scene, did you see any of the uh, handoff of the weapon from the armor to the actor? I did not. Okay. Um, and then at some point, do you go to lunch? Yes. Um, and when lunch is over, tell us what happens. After lunch, um, um, I had gotten a ride up to set from our base camp, which was just a few minutes away uh, down the road. And um, I had walked from where they drop us off up to where the church is. and. Um, was waiting for the rest of the crew and the rest of the departments to get to set as well. Uh, and so I sat down on the, the end of a tailgate that was nearby. I believe it was electric truck, but I'm not positive. Okay. Tell us what happened after that. Sorry. It's okay. Take your time. I was talking to whoever was sitting next to me, uh, maybe a locations person, I don't remember, and the sound of a gun went off, um, or I heard the sound of a gun. And I looked over at who was sitting next to me and I said, uh, are we rehearsing? Because I didn't know that we were back in at that point and I hadn't heard anything on the radio about us being back in and uh, from lunch. And I said, I didn't hear anybody call, you know, fire in the hole, or, or normally, like you would hear, the armorer would say um, quarter load, half load, full load, whatever type of ammunition that they are shooting. Uh, and none of that was said. So as soon as I said that, I grabbed the bag, my bag, my normal bag, and I ran into towards the church. I wasn't very far from it. And at that, as I was approaching the door, I heard um, medic emergency come over the radio. And, and are you the only medic on set? I am. Okay. So when you heard medic emergency on the radio, did that information tell you where to go? No. Um, How did I you did know not. where to go? I was there. I was sitting, I was sitting there uh, outside the church waiting. Okay. Understood. Please proceed. Um, so I got to the door, and um, one of the things that we are taught in, in EM, when you're becoming an EMT is your scene needs to be safe before you... Uh, go into it. So I, I stood at the door and I looked around to see what was happening and I asked what happened and somebody said, um, <clears throat> Helena was shot or the gun went off, some, something to that effect. And I looked down at Helena who had been sitting at that point um, to my right and, and Joel was on the left um, um, in, in obvious pain uh, and, and Alec Baldwin was at the back of the church from me, the opposite end of the church from me. Um, and then um, I looked down at Helena again, and as I started going towards her, I, I believe it was um, our camera operator, Reed, had asked uh, her if she could feel her legs. And uh, for one, I believe she said yes. For the other one, um, she said no. And so I knew that there was some sort of spinal injury at that point. And um, as I was going towards her, I could see the blood um, Dropping, dripping from the from her back onto the church floor. Um, was she still seated at this point, or was she? She was leaning, uh, kind of on a pew. Okay. Um, and um, in my regular, my smaller bag, I carry I carry trauma shears, and um, and so I started cutting up the back of her jacket uh, to try to find where she was bleeding from, and. Um, at some point in time, uh, I believe it was Ann Shim, our second second AD, asked me if there's anything that I needed or she could do for me. And I, or, or at, before that, I'm sorry, I had I called out on the radio for somebody to call 911. We would need an ambulance. And Ann then asked me um, if I needed anything, and I asked her to get me my my bigger trauma bag because that's where I keep my trauma related um, items. And she did, and I asked her to also call Matt Hemmer, um, who was one of our electricians. I asked him, her to call him because he had some previous um, 
military experience medically, and, and he was one of the people I knew I could get up there to help me. Being the only medic and two patients is not easy. And so I had him just take over um, for Joel while I, I tended to Helena. And so if you can kind of explain to us um, what kind of treatment you attempted um, uh, with regard to Miss Hutchins. When I cut up um, the front of her, or the back of her jacket, I'm sorry, um, I grabbed some gauze and I put it on the, the one hole that I could find at that point. And I asked, um, at that point, I believe it was Reed was next to me. I gave him a glove and I asked him to hold that gauze there. And, um, and, and sometime in the meantime, we had moved the pews or the guys had moved the pews away and laid her down. Um, and I went to the front of her to cut up the front of her shirt uh, to the chest area to try to find um, the other hole. Knowing that um, Joel had been shot, it, I knew that it was a through and through or in one side out the other. You already suspected that it was a through and through? Yes, because okay. Joel was, Joel, because of the way that Joel was um, screaming in pain, I knew he had likely, um, whatever had gone through her had gone into him as well. Okay, please proceed. Um, so I cut up the front and I could not find an entrance wound and so I had to um, keep looking until I found the or the other wound. I didn't know what was entrance and what was exit at that point. Um, and when I did, I found I grabbed another um, gauze that I have and I put it there um, to apply pressure. Um, and I'm not sure at what point. I think I asked Serge or somebody who was um, somebody else who was nearby to to hold that and apply pressure while I went and grabbed oxygen. Okay, and so uh, give us just a little bit of information about your oxygen apparatus and what you did with that. Um, it's in my main bag, so I grabbed it. I grabbed my main bag and pulled it over, and um, it's a non-rebreather, so it's uh, it's the mask that goes over the face and it has a bag at the bottom that inflates, and so you can the oxygen is delivered that way um, through the mask. Um, it's got the things go around the back of the head, hold the mask on. Okay. And just to be clear, we heard some uh, testimony earlier in the trial about Ms. Hutchins being intubated. Did you have anything to do with that process? I did not. Okay. Um, go ahead and proceed. Um, so I put oxygen on her and I called back to the ambulance, I, um, or to the, on the radio, I'm sorry. I called okay. back on the radio um, to make sure to have somebody call back or whoever was communicating with 911 that we would need two ambulances and a bird at that point because I knew Joel would need an ambulance and she was going to need a helicopter. You already knew she was going to need a helicopter. With that kind of um, trauma, yes. We are we are 15 18 minutes from the hospital from from town. Um, and the, with the way that she was bleeding, I knew she wasn't going to she was going to need more than she than we could provide or, or an ambulance could provide or Santa Fe hospitals could provide. She needed to go to the trauma center in Albuquerque. Okay. And do you have any knowledge about the condition that a patient has to be in in order for the helicopter to take off? They need to be stabilized. And do you have, do you, do you know why that is given your medical training? Uh, I do not. Okay. Fair enough. Um, After you called for two ambulances and a helicopter, what did you do at that point in time? I just continued. Um, uh, Helena was fighting. Um, she didn't want the oxygen on her face. She didn't want um, anybody holding anything on her. She, she was fighting. Um, And, and Serge was there too. Um, were you, at, after, uh, we understand that you were uh, providing oxygen and that Ms. Hutchins was struggling with that. Um, was there anything else that happened other than that before uh, paramedics arrived and took over that you can recall? Um, there was a point in time when, um, when I when I first had walked in, uh, um, there were still people inside, and so I had I had said to wh 
whoever was there AD wise um, to to remove anybody that was in the church that didn't need to be there if they weren't some of the people that I had asked to help then they needed to be removed Alec being one of them he was it, still in the church uh, shortly after I got in there sorry I'm, I'm bouncing backwards a little no bit. no it's okay um, it, so you asked an assistant director to do that for you I believe either assistant director or PA somebody and a PA is a production production assistant, assistant which is um, when you're first trying to get in the union as a um, in, in in their union as a as an AD you have to become a PA first and you have to have so many days of PA work okay. um, that you submit to the union before you can start as the next I believe it's the second second is the okay all right understood uh, so whoever it was that you spoke to and you asked them to uh, remove Mr. Baldwin and any other unnecessary people, did, did that person do that for you? Yes. Okay. Um, and at some point did paramedics arrive? Yes. Um, do you have any, any idea how long it took them to get there? It felt like forever. Um, I believe though it was, I don't have an exact time. Um, I believe 12, 15 minutes. Okay. Um, and? And I do believe that there was a, uh, before the ambulance arrived, there there might have been somebody else, a police, police officer, maybe that was around, but ambulance-wise, it was quite some time. Okay, and do you recall a police officer coming in with a medical bag and handing items to you? I do, okay. vaguely, but I do. Okay. Um, in your medical training, are you aware of, of um, the procedure that's done when a person is intubated, even though you didn't participate in that in this case? Yes. And are you aware that sometimes... Objection. Okay, Ms. Schaefer, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna finish that question. Uh, thank you very much. I'll pass the witness. Cross exam. Hello, Ms. Schaefer. Hello. I'm gonna start with this incident you talked about on direct uh, with the the ammunition and uh, Ms. Gutierrez putting it into her fanny pack, okay? Okay. Um, so first, uh, you don't know the difference between blanks and dummies, right? I do not, not, not visually. Right, and um, did is what you saw in that one instance, Sarah Zachary bringing Hannah Gutierrez the different boxes of ammunition? She was next to Hannah. I'm, I'm not sure exactly where the boxes were staged. Right, but you saw Sarah bring her a box, um, and then Ms. Gutierrez take um, the rounds and put them in her fanny pack, right? Correct. Okay. 
And you don't know if Sarah had shaken those box before she brought or those rounds before she bought them. Brought them, right? I do not. Can metal prop guns that can't fire, um, that can't fire re like replicas, like gun replicas, would those require safety checks? Sure, sure. Ms. Schaefer, you said you worked on several um, film sets before, right? Yes, ma'am. And you've given us testimony today about what you saw and safety checks and whatnot, right? Yes, ma'am. Right. Do you know what a replica gun is? Can you... I, I can tell you... I, do, I would not know if somebody showed me a plastic... or put a plastic gun near me or one that could fire. So whichever way you were referring to replica, I do not know. Because I would consider that a prop gun versus something the armorer would be in charge of. So you you are not... Did you just say you don't know the difference between a replica gun and a real gun? If I were not to see them, touch them in front of me, no, I would not. Are you aware whether a replica gun even requires safety checks? I'm confused by your words. Do you mean a... a if you mean a rubber gun, that does not need safety checks. You would not check a rubber gun. But if it is a gun that you put ammunition of any kind in, whether it's dummy or, um, you know, whatever other the quarter loads that they use, then those would need to be checked for safety. But a rubber gun would not. And you're saying that despite never working as an armor before, right? That is correct. I am not an armor. And you've, you've never even worked in props as a props assistant, have you? I have not worked in props. That is not my craft. And um, have, you, have you ever worked on a set where there was actually a part-time armor? Part-time? No. Right. Um, day players, yes, but not part-time. So who is in charge of the gun cart when the armor has to go to the, the restroom? That would... Um, we. I've never been in that situation. If somebody needed, um, if the armorer was in the restroom, I would assume we would wait until the armorer was available to do their job. That would not be somebody for any other department that I am aware of. When you saw this incident with um, Sarah Zachary bringing Hannah this ammunition, um, and, and you saw Hannah, you said put it in a fanny pack, right? Correct. You don't know if those were blanks or dummies, do you? I do not. And you, are, were you aware that Ms. Gutierrez's fanny pack had multiple separators in it? I was not. I, I did not. I just saw her pouring them in. I did not see anything other than the pouring motion. And you don't follow Ms. Gutierrez or Sarah Zachary all day on set, do you? I do not. And you don't know if there are safety checks done that were out of your presence, do you? I, I do not. Is it true that you have filed a lawsuit against David Hall's PDQ, Seth Kinney, and Sarah Zachary, and Hannah Gutierrez? Yes, it is true. Among others, right? Correct. And in that lawsuit, you claim that you've been traumatized by the incident, right? Absolutely. 
and you have uh, you are actually seeking money damages in that lawsuit for that extreme emotional distress. That is correct. Did you in fact obtain a civil judgment against Sarah Zachary in that lawsuit for a sum of money? Uh, it has been entered into judgment, yes. Um, and your your case against Ms. Gutierrez, that's still pending, right? That is correct. Do you believe that your testimony here today is going to help you in your civil case against her? I'm not here for my civil case. I'm here oh. for this case. I, I understand what you're here for, ma'am, but uh, do you believe that your testimony here is going to help you in that case? I'm not thinking about that case. I'm thinking about the fact that had our armorer, or our first AD, done their jobs, we would not be here. A woman would not be dead. A mother would not be gone. And you filed a civil lawsuit over this? Yes. For your damages? Correct. To get money? Did not for money. It's not how it started. And you, ma'am, are uh, an EMT basic or an EMT? What is your EMT training? EMT. There is an EMT, there's EMT advanced or advanced EMT, and there's paramedic. And you do have a certification, right? Yes, I do. Are you licensed through the state of New Mexico? I am, and the state of California, as well as national registry. In fact, you also have medical experience working at a hospital for almost three years, That right? is correct. Um, and that was in an overflow unit for the emergency room? I, uh, we need to approach. What is your experience? Um, you did say you worked at the hospital, but what is your experience with treating gunshot wounds? Um, I do not have experience with, with gunshot wounds. They were not on the floor I worked on. Uh, why wouldn't you be trained on, um, on that type of, of injury when you're dealing on a, on a set with real guns? I am trained for it. You asked about my experience at the hospital. Okay, so you are trained with treating gunshot wounds. Correct. But you just don't have experience actually applying that training, is that fair? Not in the hospital setting or outside of it, correct. You said on direct that you had two trauma bags? I have my normal bag, which has, I, it's a 96% bag, it's kind of like a walking Walgreens, but it, it has um, uh, gauze in it and trauma shoes, in case something else is needed until I get my main trauma bag. Did you have any equipment with you on that day specifically addressed to treating a gunshot wound? No. You didn't have chest seals? No. Did so you have any IVs? I am not licensed to start IVs. So I would not. And we are on a movie set where there should be no gunshot wounds. Well, are there other things on a movie set that could cause a thoracic puncture on the not, set? Not generally. Um, not generally, if there is going to be something that's going to happen where something more traumatic like that could happen, then we would request a standby ambulance to be on set with us so that we had all the gear and equipment needed, as well as additional medics to help. But this uh, movie had knives involved in it, right? I could not tell you. And horses? There were horses. Snakes? There were wild snakes. We did not bring them onto set.
Do you know who intubated Ms. Hutchins? I do not. I can assume, but I do not. You said, um, you can assume. Well, I mean, were you, did you see it happen? I did not. Okay. Prior to, all of these, these concerns that you're telling us about here today with Ms. Gutierrez, did you never raised any of those concerns with anyone? I did not. Not even the safety director, David Halls? I did not. And you said on direct, uh, I believe, that prior to the, the shot that you heard on that day, um, that I think I heard you say, I wanna get it clear, that you did not hear Dave Halls yell out, rehearsals up, first team on set. Did you ever hear that? I did not. You never heard any call out that they were gonna do that set? No, no, not on, not on the radio, I did not hear it. Uh, it doesn't mean it didn't happen and I didn't hear it, but... Um, no, I just want to know what you heard. You I did not hear, hear that, no. Okay. No further questions. <coughs> Ms. Schaefer, are chest seals and IVs um, customary for movie set medics? chest seals if you can get them uh it, we, we're not it's not like we can go to a hospital and pick up equipment that or, or, or products that we would keep in our bags whatever we generally keep in our bags is something that we buy over the counter um there are ways to make chest seals but they're not the most um they're, they they sometimes hurt more than than help um ivs would be something that needs to be ordered and if you do not have um medical direction or a doctor that works at an ER that says, yes, you can work to your scope of practice or your license level. If you don't have that, which most medics in New Mexico don't have, most medics don't have that medical direction, uh, you are not allowed to, to do that on outside of a hospital setting or outside of a, if you are employed by a, a EMS. Okay. Um, and shifting gears, you were asked on cross-examination some questions about um, whether or not safety checks of ammunition uh, would have taken place outside your presence. Do, do you recall that question? Yes. In your experience, are the safety checks of the ammunition done in the presence of the crew and the cast? Yes. Do you know if there's a reason for that? I'm not sure. Well, if a safety check of ammunition was done outside the presence of the cast and crew, would the cast and crew have knowledge as to the level of safety associated with that ammunition? Not if it was not done in front of them, no. Um, but the cast and crew are all welcome to ask for it to happen. Okay. Um, you were asked some questions about a civil lawsuit and you you were asked if you were testifying today because you thought it would help your civil lawsuit correct um and i think your response was you didn't do it for money that's not how it started so i'd like you to and then i think you got cut off i'd like you to go ahead and finish that the reason that I brought any kind of lawsuit to anybody in the in the in the beginnings is because i wanted change <clears throat> in our industry. I did not want something like this to be able to happen again to anybody else, to their families, to the crew that knows them as family. Um, I wanted some sort of change to happen, some policy change, um, whether it be required to have a standby ambulance or it be required to have additional medics if there's going to be big stunts or big gunfire or anything that could potentially cause, you know, somebody to become injured. I wanted that change in our industry because on that on that show there were 75 roughly 75 crew that is minimal to compared to what i normally would have on set i would have no less than 300 usually before i would be approved to have an additional medic to come and help me that is just not okay that is not okay and being the only medic there with two patients knowing my resources were not close enough to to help in any significant way is what i wanted to change and 
have you suffered from uh, extreme trauma uh, as a result of this? Yes. Um, I, can I just expand? Sure. I don't object. Uh, sh I, okay. Um, let's proceed. Um, upon my questioning, you asked if uh, I asked you uh, about your claim for uh, emotional distress, and, and you responded and asked if you could expand on that. The court is going to let you. Please expand. Thank you. I went home that night, and I looked at my little boy the same age as Helena's son and all I could think about is how I could not save his mother's life and how he was going to grow up without a mother and how her spouse lost the love of his life okay. uh, I did not expect this testimony I did not expect this testimony um, so you're going to uh, and I mean no harm to you, but we're going to strike that testimony, okay? So disregard that testimony, okay? All right, let's, uh, let's. Okay, uh, all right, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate right. your time. All right, thank you. The emotional um, expense, the la her narrative, where she said, can I expand on that? And then she continued on and on and on. 
that's what you're going to strike, okay? You're going to disregard that as evidence. The rest of it, her direct, her cross-examination, and then her redirect, except when she said, can I expand on that, and then went into, um, you know, her personal trauma, okay? Do you, any, any questions on that? Okay, thank you. Are you ready for the next witness, Your Honor? Yes, I am. State calls Mamie Mitchell. Counsel? Counsel yes, Coach? Counsel Coach. Do you swear firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Speak into the microphone. Thank you. Ma'am, will you state your full name for the record? Mamie Elizabeth Mitchell. And Ms. Mitchell, uh, what do you do for a living? I'm a substitute teacher. How long have you been a substitute teacher? Uh, I think around two and a half weeks. <laughs> so prior to being a substitute teacher, what did you do for a living? I was a Hollywood script supervisor. And can you explain to the jury what a script supervisor does? Sometimes I pre-time the script. We don't know what that means. I, know I, read, I read the script, and in my mind, I give a producer and director an idea of how long their movie is. And based on that, they'll cut some scenes or add some scenes, build some sets or not build the sets. So it's a budgetary thing. Um, while we're shooting a film, I provide the actors with lines if they need them. Um, I keep the continuity in all areas. And, and when you say you keep the continuity, can you explain to us what that means? It means that your right hand is on your right hip and you're leaning on your left hand. And I'm going to make sure you do that every time we shoot. That scene. The camera. That scene for, these, for that dialogue. So it's maintaining the continuity, which gives which brings me to that the thing that I really do is to ensure that a film cuts together seamlessly in the editing room, which gives the, uh, the director uh, choices. Um, as a part of being a script supervisor, uh, do you keep very close track of all of the filming that's done on the set and the scenes that have been filmed? Yes, I log every shot lens, 
how long the shot is, if it's incomplete, if it's good, if it's not good, if it's fair, if it's the best one. And if there's an airplane on line six, but then the airplane, it's okay in line nine, sound, everything that has to do with the photography, I have in here, and that's translated to the editing room. Okay, how long uh, were you a script supervisor before you decided to become a substitute teacher? Uh, about 42 years. And in those years that you uh, have worked in the film industry, um, how many movies and uh, TV shows do you think you've worked on? 74. And of those 74 shows, if you can guesstimate for us how many of those um, had live guns and an armorer? I think I've worked with an armorer about 24 times, on 24 films. Okay. Sometimes, yeah, go ahead. Sometimes maybe a gun is used one time, and if the armor was brought in for that, I'm not really aware of that. Uh, oh. But when guns are really a part of a, of a, of a script, about 24 times. Okay. Um, safe to say you have a lot of experience with uh, armorers on movie sets. I do. Um, as the script supervisor, are you present for every single take that is filmed for every single scene? Unless it's a second unit, and I have a second unit script supervisor, but for every first unit shot, I am on, I'm there for every take. On the set of Rust, uh, were you there for every take? Yes. Okay. So, I am going to ask you if you noticed any differences between Ms. Gutierrez and the other armors that you worked with on the previous 24 occasions. Ma'am, do you recall the question? No, unfortunately not. Um, how did Ms. Gutierrez compare to the other previous 24 armorers that you worked with? I found her to be inexperienced and did not present in the, in the way that I'm used to seeing professional armors, union armors, uh, on a film set. It was different. Um, did you find her behavior on the film set to be professional? I did not. Um, did you, 
Did you ever take notice of where firearms uh, were stored during filming or around the set? I saw them on her cart. And when you saw them on her cart, was she present? Not all the time. And was that unusual? Everything about the cart was unusual. When you say everything about the cart was unusual, can you explain to the jury what you mean? In my experience, what I have experienced on film sets is that the armors are very quiet, uh, focused, and very organized. Everything is very organized. And they're very focused. I don't know if I said that, but they're very focused and sort of methodical about okay. everything. Their movements are very methodical. I'm gonna take you back to your concerns about the cart specifically. Um, can you explain uh, what your concerns were with the state of the prop cart? Well, I just never seen anything like it. it. It just reminded me, I mean, it, not that it reminded me, but the best way I can describe it is it was like that drawer in your kitchen where you just put stuff that doesn't really go anywhere else, the random things, and you go in to look for something, and just, it was messy to me. It looked different than what I was used to. Did it seem organized? No, it did not seem organized. Um, at, at any point in time, were you aware that there were what I'm going to refer to as accidental discharges that took place on set? I was on the set at the cabin. Uh, hang on, you're, you're, you're a step ahead of me. Um, were you aware of the accidental discharges? Yes. Okay. Um, were you present for the accidental discharges? Yes. Okay. Can you go ahead and explain to us what, what happened with regard to those accidental discharges? Well, I believe the first one, I was walking... Shall I describe the set? I was, I was, uh, from here to where those people are back there, away, walking back. We had camped out over here for a wide shot, and so we kind of moved back, and as I was walking back, there, there was just a gun, a gunshot went off. There was a gunshot, and it was frightening. Um, and do you know... Um, do you know the circumstances of that accidental discharge? Well, it was one of them that I know about now. No, no, that's okay. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of, when you heard the gunshot go off, uh, why was it frightening? It's a western, you know. We've heard that there's lots of guns and blanks, and because it doesn't happen. What doesn't happen? Guns do not just go off on a film set. Um, in your career, do you recall having that ever happen to you? I do not. And when, can you give the jury a little bit of, of um, background on, Given that guns go off on movie sets because there's blank ammunition in the gun and guns are being shot, um, why would it why would it have startled you? What what's the procedure usually for gunshots? Fire in the hole. Someone yells, "Fire in the hole." Um, and it, what does what does that tell you when someone yells that? To Tell us what you're doing. Ear, fingers in your ears, mouth open. Keep, you have to keep the mouth open. Why do you keep your mouth open? It helps your eardrums. Something about that. We just, that's what we do. We're taught, that's, I've known that forever. You keep your mouth open and you go like this. Okay. Um, 
So you protect your hearing. With regard to the accidental discharges, um, did anyone call fire in the hole? No. Um, and how many accidental discharges occurred while you were working on set? Two. And do you recall if they were the same day? They were the same day, same set. Did they cause you to uh, feel concerned? I was concerned and I was confused. What do you mean confused? Shortly after I was hired by Roe Waters to do this movie. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I think I understand and I'm going to stop you. Okay. Um, so let me, uh, and, and let's, uh, let me, let me take you to, I'm sorry, let me back up. Okay. Um, Ma'am, you indicated that you are on the set of rest, you were present for the uh, filming of every, every take of every scene, is that right? Yes. Um, and I am, wait a minute, let's get out of there. to show you what is marked as States Exhibit 164. I'm going to ask to have it entered into evidence, admitted into evidence, and permission to publish. No objection, Your Honor. All right, States 164 is admitted and you may publish. <coughs> so, Ms. Mitchell, um, you're present every time they're rolling camera, is that right, on rest? With the exception of sometimes uh, a, just a couple of times. Um, hey, let, 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 let me ask you this. Um, do you recall uh, meeting with me and me showing you a video that I wanted you to talk about? That was from October 17th. Do you recall that? No. Okay. Um, oh, I don't. Would you refresh? Could you refresh my memory, please? <laughs> uh, I, I will refresh your memory. Um, we're going to have to unplug because I'm going to have to refresh. I'm sorry. That's okay. It's all right. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Do you, I, do you recall? You know what I'm talking about now? I do. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I think we can turn the monitors back on. Let's go ahead. Um, were you present for the filming of that take? Yes, I was. All right. I'm going to pull up States Exhibit 164 and publish. Ma'am, do you recall the date that this particular take was filmed? I'm sorry. It, hey, hang on just a second. That's in order for you to, to in, in order for you to refer to your notes, we need you to 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 have a discussion with us. Okay. So, as you sit here today, do you recall the date that this was filmed? I don't recall the date, but it's in my script. Okay. Would it refresh your memory if you looked at your notes? Yes. Okay. So what I want you to do, listen to me carefully. I am. I want you to look at your notes. And then I just want you to keep that information to yourself. Wait a second, don't look at your notes. Okay. They get to approach you and see what you're looking at. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'm going to have this. When you look in your notes, just take note of the date and then wait for a follow up question, okay? Okay. Do you, does counsel wish to approach to see what she's looking at? I don't need to see her notes. Do you, do you want to see her notes? I'd like to see it. Sure. 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 Yeah. Okay. Shall I open it up? Okay. <laughs> All right. You can come around here if you want. Okay.
<laughs> Ms. Mitchell, go ahead and take your time and see if you can find that. I, I apologize. Well, I don't want to get into why this is confusing, but uh, I think a gremlin came in and took the page because I can't find it. Hey, hang on. Should be October uh, 20th. It's October 20th. No. No? Stop for a second. You're, we, I told you to wait for a follow up question. Sorry. Don't just speak, okay? Okay. Wait, wait, wait with us. Okay. Here it is. I found it. Are you sure? I'm sure. Okay, has your memory been refreshed as to the date? Yes. And, and let me just ask you, and you can close, you, you, take note of the date, okay? And is there something that's on the screen that, that helps you refer to your notes? 1017. You, 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 no, go ahead and answer my question. Yes. What's on the screen that helps you refer that, that helps you find that in your notes? 125 Charlie, the scene number. Okay, so the 125C is the scene number. Is that what you said? That's the slate number. The scene is 125. This is the slate number. Okay. Um, and, and so are you able to compare your notes to the information on that slate? Yes. And were you present for the filming of this take? I was. And what was the date that this was filmed on? October 17th, <laughs> All right. 2021. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and publish it now. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Mark. We gotta do the footprints again. Here we go. So we're here. He's camera left. No, that's it. I'm sorry. Um, it's my understanding that part of your job is continuity. Is that right? Correct. So I'm going to ask you: Can you identify this prop that we're looking at right here uh, on on Mr. Baldwin? Yes. What is that prop? It's his over-the-shoulder holster. And bandolier. His holster or bandolier, you said? Mm -hmm. And what, what are these things that, that are right here? Bullets. Um, and are, are, is that the way that the bandolier was loaded on October 17th. Correct. Thank you, ma'am. Um, all right, let's uh, shift gears a little bit. Um, Ms. Mitchell, I'm going to take you to the date of October 21st, uh, 2021. Uh, were you working on set that day? Yes. Um, we understand that there was some filming in the morning, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. Um, do you recall taking a lunch break that day? I did. Um, and, well, let me back up. We've, we've heard a lot of testimony that the camera crew walked off that day. Yes. A and um, did you have a discussion with Mr. Souza and Ms. Hutchins about making the day? I did. Okay, without saying what they said, uh, can you just tell us, tell us what you said to them in terms of that conversation? I said, I, I turned to Helena and, and I said, I shoot with one camera all my career until shooting with two cameras became the thing. I said, if, and Joel, and then Joel, and then I looked at Joel, and I said, if we're organized, 
and you have a plan, we can make the day with one camera. And Elena said, I shoot with the one camera too all the time. Okay, uh, provided only for only for context. Um, so we understand that there was some filming and then you went to lunch. I, I want you to start after lunch uh, where, where it's our understanding that, that, uh, that there's a, something going on in the church preparing for a scene. If you can describe that to us, please. Do you recall, let me, let me ask you this, when, uh, when you went into the church after lunch, were other people already there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and after lunch. After lunch. We're only going to talk about after lunch. Okay. Yes. Uh, so when you were in the church after lunch, um, who do you recall being in the church? Doran Curtin. And, and, and Ms. Curtin, what, what was her role on set? Wardrobe. Okay. Okay. Keep going, please. She had blood. She was going to refresh blood. Um, fake, fake blood, I assume. Fake blood. Okay. I switched places with her because she's real tall. And I said, could I stand in front of you? And we laughed, and I went in front of her. Helena uh, Serge, my director, Ross, Zach, uh, Alec Baldwin in the pew with the gun, Karen Kuhn. Who, who's Karen Kuhn? She's a still photographer. Thank you. And she was on this side. Okay, thank you. Uh, coming into the church, I think there was a special effects guy there, maybe the supervisor. Okay. Do you, let me ask you this. When you came into the church, did Mr. Baldwin already have his gun? Oh, yeah, yes. Okay, so you didn't see how he got the gun or who handed him the gun? I did not. Okay, so you come into the church. Uh, Dave Hall was there also. Okay, Mr. Halls was there. Sorry. Um, how long before the gun goes off are you in the church? Not very long at all. Okay, so when you come into the church, um, uh, you've indicated these people were there. What, what was happening in the moments before the gun went off? I switched place with Doran. Um, uh, uh, Helena was here, and she's doing her thing with the light, you know, looking at him. She's doing her lighting. And, and people are not static on a film set. So she's, it's a dance. And she's doing this and looking at the, there was an onboard monitor, and Joel is looking, and they're there, and she's doing her thing and looking at him and, and that. And uh, I don't know what everybody else was doing, but that's what they were doing. Because okay. I, I saw the camera. I knew I had an idea of what shot it was, one of three. I wasn't, hadn't seen the lens yet, so I wasn't sure what it was yet. And, uh, and that's what they were doing. Uh, and then what happened? And then I took my phone out. It's okay. Don't, I took don't, my phone yeah. out. Oh, he, uh, the actor was practicing on his own. Mr. Baldwin. Yeah, he was practicing, and as I was doing, he was practicing, and then um, when I looked down to my phone uh, to get his, I looked, got the picture. I was going to check his wardrobe, make sure everything matched. And, and let me stop you. As a part of your continuity job, do you frequently take photos and, and videos on your phone? I frequently take photos. Okay. Sometimes it flips. Uh, it, I take photos. Okay. Uh, when you said sometimes it flips, is the, uh, on occasion, uh, do you end up with a live photo or a short video? Yes. Okay. Uh, so you're you're using your phone for continuity. Take constantly. Okay. Uh, what happens then? So 
I was I got my picture and I was gonna check his wardrobe and right when I was doing that explosion. Um and when that happens, what do you do? I uh well I my it, my body I had a black it was a uh, shock and then I heard mo a guttural moaning and I looked around and my director was crab crawling backwards and then I turned around to look at Alec and when I did she was falling in my direction and I ran and when you say she was falling you mean Elena Hutchins, Hutchins was falling it, and I ran it, and when you why did you run to get help and so and away from danger okay uh, where did you go I ran down the, out the door down the steps to the left towards the one of the set I, I, you know I, it was a set deck truck one of the trucks and pull and and uh, I had and I, with my phone and I start dialing 911 and uh, are you the person that that called 911 in this case I am and when you spoke to 911, how did you describe uh, the incident that you were calling them for? Um, Ms. Mitchell. I believe I said, um, I believe I said we've had two people shot accidentally on a film set. We need help immediately. And why did you use the word accidentally? I did not want her to think there was an active shooter or a mass shooting. I needed and gather an army together. I needed, I, I wanted to come right away. Okay. Help right away. And, and you thought that, that if, if law enforcement or, or medics thought that it was an active shooter, it may take them more time, is that what you mean? That's correct. Okay. Um, and Ma'am, have you also filed a civil lawsuit against the production company and other folks in this case? I have. Are you testifying today because you think it's going to help your civil lawsuit? No, it's not going to help my civil lawsuit at all. Um, are you testifying truthfully today? I am. Thank you, ma'am. I'll pass the witness. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. I just have a few questions for you, not too much. Um, first of all, I want to go back to your movies with the other armors. You said there was about 24 of them, give or take. Okay. Um, on those, did you ever have a situation where there was a part-time armor, <clears throat> to your knowledge, somebody that did part-time armory and part-time something else? I think there might have been one or two. Were those day, day people, or was that part time? What's that term you used earlier, day, when they just come in for a day and then they're gone? A day player. Day player. Was were those day players, or was that a part time armor? Do you mean was it a prop master who also does armory? Yes, or yes. Even a day player did both. I don't remember. Okay. It's a day player. Okay. Um, now, with regard to seeing um, the cart you mentioned, do you know whether when you saw the cart sometimes whether those firearms on there were real or whether they were replica firearms? Not to my knowledge. I think everything was a, a real firearm. Okay. Are you not aware whether there were any replica firearms, any fake type firearms on rust? No. Okay. Now, also, you were aware that the armor would be called to scenes sometimes, right? That she'd have to be on a scene when they were filming? I don't know what you mean by on a scene. 
Okay, in or around it, when, when firearms are being used, she had to be in or around that scene? All armors have to be present when a firearm is being used. Okay, and that wasn't my question. My question was, did you know on this movie set that the armor sometimes had to be in or near the scene when firearms were being used? Yes. Okay. So on those times, it would be impossible for the armorer to be at her cart too, right? Well, I've never heard of that before. Well, kind of hard to be in two places at one time, isn't it? That's kind of the point. Um, now, did you know whether this cart, this cart was shared with props and armory men? I think it was. So, when you know you saw the messy, and you, you described it, your kitchen drawer where you put everything. Do you know if the props people were coming and putting their stuff on it too? I think they were. Okay. And so do you know who might have caused the, you know, things to be in different places? Was it props or you don't know who was doing that? Do you? I do. Who? They were all doing it. Okay. So did you see them? Yes. You saw Sarah, Zachary putting stuff on it? Three women at a cart. Sometimes. Okay. Now, with regard to the um, the discharge that you said you heard, you remember that? Which one? Well, you described one. You were walking. I think you said you heard a sound, a shot. Is that right? A misfire. Yes. Okay. Two of them. Okay. Did you find out about that well after? Or did you actually, were you actually there? I was there. It almost blew my ears out. Okay. Now, do you know whether any of that was special effects? It was not special effects. Okay. Did you report that to anybody? Everyone, everyone, I didn't have to report it. Everybody knew it. Okay. Everybody in production? I, I don't know about production. Everyone on the set heard it. Okay. Do you know if Dave Halls heard it? Dave Halls was there. Okay. So he would have known, so you wouldn't have had to tell him, right? Everyone who was at that set, on that set, and there were a lot of people, heard the gun go off accidentally. About two, twice. Okay, a uh, different topic in the script. Do you remember whether it required a draw in the scene uh, on October 21st, 2021, after lunch? Did that scene require a draw from the holster? For the actor, for Mr. Baldwin, to draw from his holster? It did. Okay. Do you remember if that required him to point the, the weapon? That's not the shot that we discussed before lunch. Okay. So was that in the script or, or not? No. Okay. I have nothing to do with that. I don't have any additional okay. questions. Thank you. Thank you. You're Thank excused. You Thank you. Have a beautiful morning. You too.
All right, we're going to break for the week. So, you no, know, just because we did a whole week. All right, I don't want to confuse anybody. We're going to break for the for the day. Okay. All right. So, please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Do not do any research. Do not Google um, about the case or the trial. You know the the rust production, anything, okay? The evidence is what you receive in court. Very, very important, okay? Have a good and safe weekend. We'll see you this One of the jurors wants just to... Uh, one of the jurors wants to be reassured that we're not going past the 8th. I can't give that re reassurance, okay? I, I, can, can we approach on yeah, that, though? Sure. It might be helpful. <clears throat> Is that correct? Okay. You don't have to, nobody has to nod their head on which one of you wants to know. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so not past, whether, whether it's going to go past the 8th, they think that they will finish their case um, the day before that. Yeah, and that would be finishing both cases. Yes. Assuming everything goes at the right clip, but okay. then, but okay. so. Judge, just a, a point of, of clarification. What we discussed is that we expect, hopefully, to be doing closing arguments the morning of the 7th. Okay, but that doesn't mean your de deliberations are not going to go past the 8th. All right? Because once it's handed to you, it's however long you all deliberate. Okay? So I would say, in an abundance of caution, that it will go past the eighth as far as deliberations go. That's in an abundance of caution. Okay? Just knowing jurors have to get situated after they get the evidence and then, you know, it just it just depends. Okay? Am I making myself clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. We're in recess. All right.